because we are gathered here today to celebrate all things energy. We have come to talk about energy. And as we all know, energy changes, changes the world, energy runs the world, and energy is the core of every single thing that we do. And so for all the energy enthusiasts in this place, energy advocates, energy professionals, practitioners, advisors, everybody who has joined us this morning and continues to join us as we celebrate in these three days, feel very welcome. 2020 has been a very exciting year in the energy space. We have had to rethink many things, we have had to rejig many things, we've had to rework many things and re-engineer many things. And most importantly, we have re-energized many things. And this is such a forum to enable us re-energize, have our thoughts in place as regards energy and just celebrate World Energy Day. The actual World Energy Day is on 22nd, which is tomorrow, but we are starting early because we are energy people and we are very organized in the way that we do our things as the energy body in this world. And so welcome each and every one of you. We have a very exciting program ahead and we welcome you to enjoy it. We welcome you to contribute to it and we welcome you to be part of this celebration. So immerse yourself in all things energy from today until Friday. We are doing 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. East African time for the three days. And on Friday, we have an award ceremony from 4 to 6 p.m. East African time. Please mark your calendars and call everybody you know. Don't enjoy this by yourself. Call everybody you know to come and join us. My name is Carol Gatheru. I will be your moderator for the day. I am the chairperson of the World Energy Day Secretariat, and we have a fantastic team behind us, ensuring that everything works just as it is supposed to work. I request that we maintain great meeting etiquette because we are a congregation of many people. So please mute, mute yourself until you're asked to speak. If you want to ask questions, you can do so on the chat or the moderator will ask you to unmute yourself and request, or you can use the raise hand icon and our tech team will be able to see you and ask you to join the conversation. So because we are quite a number, let us maintain great meeting etiquette. We are offering so much value for your day. By you logging in this morning, you're already making a difference in the energy space and to the world in general. Because when we look at the sustainable development goals, all of them, all 17 of them, there is none of them that cannot run without energy at the center. So what we are doing in these three days is very important and we welcome you to join us. Let me share my screen and allow you to see what's up for grabs in these three days. So welcome to the conference. This is what we are doing. We want each and every one of you to welcome everybody else. So ask people to register. The registration link is on Zoom. Please send it to them. We will put that in the chat as well so that you can then ask other people to join us. We have a great, great speaking menu. Please take a look at this. What will we be talking about in these three days? so that you clear your calendar and ensure that you're with us from the beginning to the end. We'll be talking about policy and partnerships and financing and monitoring and mobility, something that's really so, uh, an area that we want to grab a hold of and run with very fast. Innovation, interoperability, sustainability, inclusion, all kinds of inclusion. We are talking financial inclusion, we are talking gender inclusion, we are talking economic inclusion, we are talking strata, all kinds of inclusion. We'll be talking about trends as well. What's happening, what needs to happen, what used to happen and what must stop happening. So trends. Advisory, we have great speakers as you can see on the screen. We have people with a wealth of experience coming to talk to us this morning. And so advisory is the key theme running throughout this entire conference. Do not move, do not move and call others to join us. There'll be training. We have a training session, especially on the third day on Friday from nine to 11, we have compressed air systems training. So please join us for that training. The training is complimentary at no cost and we'll provide you the e-certificates at the end of the training session. So if that's an area, compressed air is an area that we really need to focus on, please join us during the training. We have an innovation challenge. Young people, 
have been doing great things, great and amazing things. And if we don't innovate, we will die. If we don't innovate in the energy space, we will die. And so they have been preparing their projects. They are ready to, to uh, present their projects. The demos will be happening on Friday. Please join in, come and look at what these young people have been doing. And the judges will judge and give us the winning team. But even those that have participated up to now are all winners. These are projects that can be monetized and projects that can create the next best thing, actually the current best thing with regards to energy. And on Friday as well, we have the Energy Awards. We have energy professionals who've been nominated. They've been doing amazing and impactful things in the energy space, and the winners will be declared in the award ceremony on Friday. And so we have such a wonderful and exciting menu of things happening. Please join us and get ready to not be the same again after this conference. We have had seven energy professional round tables ahead of this conference. We've been providing a forum where energy professionals, enthusiasts, activists, advocates have come together and in the seven round tables have been talking about significant matters to do with energy that can transform this continent. Africa it is, energy in Africa it is, and we are the ones to take this to the next level. And so therefore, here we are this morning. And as we proceed with our activities, allow me to talk about the partners that are making this happen. We have the Water and Energy for Food program run by GIZ, very passionate people. Water, energy, and food nexus. The interlinkages and interconnection with these. And you know, when we are talking about food, and especially in Africa, this is something that's at the heartbeat of the continent. So we are supported by GIZ through this program. We thank them. Enzo Impact as well, very focused on energy projects with a key focus on women, the gender affair, and young people. Thank you, Enzo Impact. And the convening partners are Reaffinity and Innovators. So much can be said about these two. We'll continue to talk about them as the program continues. So here we are. We have with us, I don't know whether we should give a standing ovation where we are or a great round of applause, but we have the president of AEE, the Association of Energy Engineers, here this morning to speak to us and to open our conference. When we first requested him to join us and to take time from his busy schedule to be part of this gathering, this energy project, sustainable is the word, because you can start projects and they don't come to pass. And so Samara, we welcome you this morning to give us your keynote address and to officially open this conference over to you. Karibu sana, as we say, very welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Hello, Africa. Hello, the world. Uh, it's really an honor to be part of this uh, fantastic conference. And it's always a pleasure to uh, support Chris and his friends uh, in their efforts to improve uh, the energy status and make the world a better place. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy what I prepared for you this morning. and. Uh, if you make me a host, I can share my screen, Caroline. Uh, All right, you can share screen. Yeah. Uh, Caroline, can you make me a host so I can share my screen? Yes, you can share your screen now. Oh, yeah, perfect. Perfect. OK. It's, uh, again, it's a fantastic to be part of this uh, effort and uh, it's an honor to be giving the opening speech. Um, the come, uh, to think about it, you know, uh, right now, during this time, it's the, the most important thing uh, is, uh, is your mobile, uh, your computer and the internet world. So the, uh, 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 the future will, uh, we will see the development of these tools and uh, it's amazing what we can do right now because 50% of my meetings i do it over the, uh, the over the mobile so um, i 
you know, it's very obvious that there will be a lot of growth in the um, uh, telecommunication and uh, the and the the um, computers and the uh, uh, handheld dev devices. So, uh, Africa will witness a lot of development in this uh, in these sectors. So, I advise you to um, pay attention to uh, uh, these sectors and uh, uh, check your local companies and uh, uh, discover what they need and uh, be part of this uh, fascinating development. Um, overall in the world, we are about uh, close to 8 billion, uh, but not all of them, they have mobiles. So we are close to 5 billion with mobiles. Uh, internet users are about uh, 4.5 and the social media and all of this uh, development uh, that is happening is about 4 billion. So about 50%. So really we, we are going to witness a lot of development <clears throat> and I uh, advise everybody to be part of this um, change because this is very rapid and you will continuously find work. Uh, so adapt your uh, skills uh, to be mobile uh, and to uh, 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 so you can communicate it very clearly over the internet. There are right now some drivers, some key drivers that we are witnessing worldwide. Of course, the first, uh, usually I don't put the pandemic, but because <clears throat> changes are happening very rapidly. So uh, really the pandemic right now is affecting everybody and there is an impact on the energy world. Um, renewable energy is the, uh, you, I would say it used to be number one, but right now it's number two. Uh, because the the lowest cost of uh, electricity is now from renewable energy, solar PV, and wind, and Africa is uh, Namibia, uh, which is close to South Africa, is number one country in the world in the quality of uh, solar to produce electricity. So, uh, in addition, you have all of North Africa. Uh, that is part of desert tech that is going to happen uh, and it's already happening actually. So there's a lot of development uh, in the renewable energy sector that you will see in the future, uh, especially because of the cost of technology is going down. Uh, the increase in population, you all know we are right now at 7.8, but in 2030 years, <clears throat> we will be at uh, close to 10 billion. So the 2,000 million people will come to the world and all of them, they will need electricity, they will need energy, food, water, and so on. So there's a lot of work uh, for the new population. The increased demand, of course, we will see uh, because of the development, increased use of technology uh, and movement with their, there will be an increased need and demand. So. Uh, this is this will need more energy engineers. They will be, we will need more renewable energy. We will need more efficiencies. Of course, we have the climate change. Climate change is something that uh, happening because of the type of uh, mainly because of the type of energy that we are using, and we we have to change that. We have to be uh, very re realistic. But <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, political issues uh, with uh, associated with climate change, so we might be successful in the short run or maybe not. But in any event, there is a lot of pollution that is happening in the world, and that is creating, uh, uh, let's say, health uh, problems, and it's also increasing the uh, the spread of the pandemic. So uh, <clears throat> the last two, we are not very successful in dealing with yet, but you never know what the future will hold. Um, these are small observations about what the pandemic has done. Uh, so the, the impact of the pandemic was really uh, to hold the activities and that led uh, to the uh, reduction on, on oil demand. So the, it, it uh, introduced a disruption in the supply chain and stopped a lot of work. Um, uh, ma major sectors of from work. Uh, it also is changing the uh, human behavior very considerably, and we're doing uh, things remotely right now. 
there's a sharp decline in some sectors. Some some really uh, were uh, badly hit, uh, and that uh, we're talking about millions of people in in, in the tourism, in the commercial and in, in transportation sector. So there is a lot of change that is going to happen in the uh, very short period of time. And in addition to the sharp decline, there's a sharp increase in the medical sector. So we're talking about all the supply chain uh, from building hospitals, from training uh, in, uh, doctors, training all the staff, uh, manufacturing PPE, getting rid of uh, personal protection equipment. So there is all the supply chain, um, all the medical supply chain has a sharp increase, exponential increase in demand. So that needs to be supported by energy. So energy is actually the, the backbone uh, for these sectors. So we'll talk about the, a little bit about the energy status, um, uh, about clean energy, energy efficiency, uh, buildings, transportation, climate change, and health and education. So um, this is the IEA, what they think, what, what is happening and what will happen in the uh, in the world in, in, in the next, let's say, uh, 10 years. So there is a lot of development in the clean technology, especially hydrogen. Um, the technology is, uh, uh, already exists in the world for, you know, for the past uh, 20 years. And there is a lot of pilot projects in uh, Germany. Uh, California and uh, Japan, but now we're talking about increased uh, and exponential growth in this technology uh, to support the clean energy transition. Of course, we are witnessing a revolution in the uh, electrical cars, and uh, most of the manufacturers are abandoning the fossil fuel cars and moving towards electrical cars. So in the next 10 years, we will see a lot of uh, electrical, electrical cars on the road and they will need infrastructure to develop uh, the, to, to provide the energy supply. So the energy supply was from renewable energy sources. We will be a, a, in a very good shape, but if the energy supply is from non-renewable energy, we will be in a bad shape. So uh, the development of clean, electricity or electrification of things is um, uh, is something that we are living actually mm -hmm. and it, it all depends on the cost of technology and the cost of technology is uh, is associated with the manufacturing uh, china is the leading uh, country in manufacturing of all uh, uh, of the majority let's say of clean energy uh, especially the the solar pv so um, we will see a lot of development uh, in uh, clean energy development and manufacturing. So there is a um, there is a growth, especially now after the pa pandemic. Uh, the um, the Chinese uh, government took a decision to double actually the manufacturing of uh, solar PV. So we will witness a rapid growth. Uh, and associated with that is the development of technology and increasing efficiency. So we will see a lot of opportunities are coming up. So uh, in installing uh, uh, solar PV where uh, we could not, uh, uh, let's say in the past 10 years. Uh, the levelized cost of energy for the few of you who know is basically is the cost of energy. So uh, this chart is showing the sharp decline. And I would like to concentrate on this battery storage. So the battery storage is the uh, next big thing right now. We will see a lot of development in uh, technologies. Uh, we will see hundreds of companies, uh, but few of them will be the leaders in this uh, sector. So uh, if we say now we have, let's say 5,000 companies in uh, developing research or selling uh, battery uh, equipment, uh, I would say 90% of them will, will close, will shut down in the next five years, and only the big, big few will uh, be able to 
increase their production, reduce the prices, and uh, take over the market. So uh, the battery storage is very important sector uh, for all energy engineers. And this will uh, create jobs uh, in all the supply chain, from the design, from the manufacturing, from the installation, from uh, to the maintenance, to decommissioning, uh, uh, even testing and commission uh, testing and the uh, commissioning, of course, uh, and decommissioning. So there's a lot of work, the, a lot of new jobs in clean, uh, clean energy, and you have to uh, realize that, and you have to educate yourself and keep educating yourself uh, in this sector. So uh, we said that we, we are going to increase. Uh, we are expecting an increase in population, but also uh, this uh, um, the, uh, the, the growth will be also accompanied by a, a decline uh, in the uh, uh, progression rate. So uh, right now, now we are expecting, let's say, 2,000 million people, as we said, to, uh, to come uh, to this world. So all of them will need uh, a lot of uh, comfort and a lot of energy. Uh, the demand on renewable energy is increasing. Sorry, sorry, but I'm a little bit uh, uh, passionate about renewable energy uh, just because it's um, uh, the... Uh, uh, common sense, I would say, uh, factor. But if you're living in a in a country where there's a lot of resources, uh, by all means, use it in a uh, efficient way. But uh, um, I'm, I'm really disappointed with the way that we are using our oil and <clears throat> other resources because the efficiency of use is very low. Uh, so right now, uh, the uh, efficiency of electricity generation is about 30, 40%, maybe, uh, unless you are using combining heat and power, then it's a different way, a uh, different uh, situation. So really the uh, uh, the use of a resource is very important and we have to use our resources very efficiently and very wisely. So there's a lot of education uh, is involved in this and we can't just accept the way things are and keep using the resources in a, in a, a let's say, inefficient way. Uh, in addition to, uh, uh, let's say, having the population growth right now, the current status uh, is that we have a huge number of people, close to 1 billion people with, uh, in poverty with less than uh, $2 per day. And all of these, they have, we have to uh, uh, find ways to elevate the, uh, alleviate this poverty. And once we do that, they will need energy and they will need the resources. So there's a lot of development happening and there is a lot of growth in the demand uh, due to alleviation of uh, poverty. Uh, in addition, um, the energy use index or how much energy we are using per person will increase. Right now, uh, only let's say the first world countries are enjoying the uh, high uh, levels of uh, energy use uh, for different uses, but this will uh, continuously change. So the remaining uh, countries in the world will need more energy. So there is a lot of demand on energy uh, uh, to uh, provide comfort and uh, that will um, it mean a lot of, uh, let's say, better buildings, better hospitals, better uh, transportation, better services in, in everything. Uh, and the fourth thing is the access to energy. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, parts in the world uh, without a, a very good grid. Uh, so you have a lot of um, distributed people uh, and uh, without access to electricity, and that will change rapidly, uh, like what is happening right now in India, uh, because of the renewable energy opportunities with uh, solar PV. So we are going to change. Uh, we will see in the next five to 10 years a rapid decrease in uh, the people without electricity because of the availability of um, off-grid solutions and microgrids. So the off-grid solution and microgrids associated uh, with the low cost of batteries will make 
make a lot of change uh, in uh, in the lives of a lot of people, and we will be able to reduce this uh, these figures. The clean energy. There are different types of clean energy. I talked about the. Uh, let's say solar PV, uh, because it's this is like a buzzword right now. Uh, we have uh, utility scale and we have decentralized, of course, utility scale is mainly used by the governments. So uh, if your government in any place in the world is producing electricity, um, you will find that the majority of the governments around the world are uh, heading towards installing large size projects to uh, uh, inject, to feed in the grid with cheap electricity because the cost of electricity from renewable energy is right now is the cheapest uh, form of uh, electricity because uh, the, the, the last figure I heard was uh, less than 1.4 US cent per kilowatt hour from solar PV utility scale. So um, the majority of the governments around the world are moving towards installing large size uh, solar PV projects. Of course, the decentralized, uh, it means that uh, anybody can install solar PV. It depends on the regulations in the country. So, so if you are, uh, let's say, experiencing high uh, cost of uh, electricity if you <clears throat> if you are one of the 75 percent of the countries around the world that means let's say uh, 150 countries around the world are importing uh, oil so if you are one of these countries that means that your cost of kilowatt hour is high and once that is the case you will find the country rapidly moving towards um, developing uh, renewable energy um, regulations so that uh, the uh, consumers can install their own systems and reduce the cost of electricity. So these decentralized uh, systems will uh, 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 pop up in, 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 uh, in oil uh, important countries. Energy efficiency, of course, is, is, is very important, but it is linked to the uh, development in technology. So so uh, there is an engineering aspect and there's a lot of education associated with energy efficiency, but also there's a lot of uh, opportunities uh, with the big manufacturers. Again, China and uh, the manufacturing countries, they dom dominate the sector. Uh, so uh, as an example, uh, without LEDs, we would not be able to save 90% on the uh, uh, lighting system. So because of the de development of technology, the LED technology, and because of the mass production of this technology in China in the past 10 years, right now, the LED technology is the uh, standard, is the new standard. Whereas 10 years ago, it was the CFL compacted uh, fluorescent lighting. So uh, opportunities everywhere. Uh, this is just um, an example of uh, a policy development. So policies um, in, uh, let's say, oil importing countries, just like uh, this is just an example of Italy. They they have a t set target to install uh, 50 gigawatt of uh, solar PV by uh, in, in 10 years. So there's a lot of uh, countries setting uh, up uh, policies to develop and install big amounts of uh, renewables uh, within their electricity uh, grids. Now, there is a report called the Renewable Energy REN21 uh, Global Status Report, and it gives you everything you need about renewable energy. But I, I, I like to just uh, show that all the talk that we are giving about this clean energy and uh, uh, wind, solar, and so on and so forth. It's just a small part of the global energy consumption. So there's a lot of uh, untapped opportunities. And once the uh, cost of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, technology drops, we will have um, 
the need. We will see big opportunities. We will need uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people working in the clean energy sector. Of course, we are not only talking about electricity. Uh, we also uh, talk about thermal. So solar thermal is very important. And of course, we have the new kid and the block which is the uh, transportation. So uh, the solar thermal is important and uh, heating the water uh, uh, for, let's say, uh, uh, the uh, cleaning and, uh, and taking a bath in the morning, the, the, the uh, domestic hot water uh, or swimming pools or industrial. And there is, a, of course, the CSP where you can increase the... Uh, the um, uh, the uh, temperature of a fluid and use it for uh, industrial applications, the transportation we said, and then the power. So there's a lot of uh, development in the power sector to in, uh, feed in a lot of renewable energy uh, into it. <clears throat> I like to show this figure just because it's an exponential. So because of the, uh, of the trend. So there's a lot of development in the clean energy sector. So. Uh, I advise everybody to learn about renewable energy. I advise everybody to start using if you're not already using renewable energy because it is the future. It is cheap. You have to educate yourself. You have to tell everybody around you about the sector. And the, uh, with all of this development, we are still uh, really at... Uh, 27% of renewable energy electricity. So we have a lot of opportunities coming up in the future, uh, especially because of this pandemic and the climate change impact. Uh, solar is at, uh, again, just look at the trend. In 10 years, we went from 23 gigawatt to 627 gigawatts. So this is a double digit uh, development every year. So I really, if you are an energy engineer, you have to learn about solar. You have to use it in, in, in your projects and tell everybody about it. Uh, these uh, big solar projects are popping up uh, all around the world. This is 1500 megawatts in China. Uh, this is one uh, 1000 megawatt or one gigawatt in India. Uh, this is one gigawatt in Abu Dhabi. So <clears throat> a lot of space. Uh, Deserts are ten, you know. Uh, I tell my clients, I tell the the, uh, the students, the engineers, if you in your facility, each meter square, each foot square, can produce uh, electricity, can produce heat for you, and that means you are uh, you can generate energy, you can reduce your uh, cost of energy, and you can uh, generate clean energy from each. A piece uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, surface that you have. Uh, I'd say surface because I also like to use vertical surfaces. It's, only, it's not only roofs or car parks, also the vertical surfaces. So please use every surface that you have to generate electricity and reduce your uh, cost of project. Of course, uh, the wind is very important, but wind really it's dominating by the big players so uh, unless you're working for one of these major players you not have the opportunity to work on this uh, on these big projects so i understand that there is a small wind uh, sector but this sector is really small and the uh, uh, the cost of kilowatt hour is higher uh, for the small wind so uh, the the development right now is really very, very impressive in the wind sector and the wind, uh, big wind companies are providing combined solution wind, uh, solar PV and storage. So uh, we will witness uh, really a, a revolution in the wind sector, uh, in, I would say in the next five years, because they will be able to uh, provide this patchable uh, energy. So it's not intermittent energy that uh, you get only when there is a wind, but this is this patchable energy uh, covering all your needs 24 seven. Uh, once they uh, get the uh, prices for uh, story, uh, battery storage down or uh, find a utility scale uh, 
uh, solution uh, in, the, in the place where they will install solar uh, uh, and PV. Uh, the offshore wind market is developing a very impressive. Uh, so if you have a lot of uh, uh, opportunities, but this is mainly in, in being developed with in the European and the US market. Uh, so the Europeans actually are developing the US market. But um, it's very promising right now. It's very promising and we will see a lot of development. It's just um, mind boggling really. Uh, the size of the wind turbines right now is about 12 mega, uh, megawatts and really we will they will keep go, uh, growing. So we will see a lot of development in the sector. But uh, again, this is, this is not for everybody. It just uh, uh, a sector that is dominated by the big players. Uh, Hydro energy is very important, uh, I would say, for uh, in Africa as well. And uh, but this is big developments. Uh, so uh, this is utility scale uh, and associated with a, with a lot of politics, with a lot of, let's say, uh, financial institutions that they need to dedicate uh, billions or mil hundreds of millions of uh, uh, amounts of money for these projects. So. And as in addition to the uh, environmental uh, aspects where you have to cover uh, huge uh, areas of land and destroy the uh, environment. So um, these are important, but uh, not everybody can do it. Uh, talking a little bit about the, uh, the energy efficiency in, uh, in, the, uh, in buildings. So, about 50% of the energy is used in heating cooling. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, in every country in the world to start developing their, their databases and collect information uh, about the different energy use inside buildings. So um, uh, usually we have heating, cooling, hot water, appliances, lighting, electronics, and some other items. So uh, it will be very good opportunities for the energy chapters to collect uh, data and uh, to develop, uh, let's say, surveys uh, and uh, publish information and they can be used and uh, improve the energy use in buildings. Um, right now, really what we're doing is just doing renewable energy plus high energy efficiency uh, and producing more energy. So the concept is right now is that we have net positive buildings. So instead of having built Things that consume energy, we are having buildings that produce energy. So really this is like a transition from the concept of providing energy for buildings because now buildings can uh, generate uh, more energy uh, than it needs. And why? Just to cover the uh, transportation uh, energy requirement. And so right now your building is providing uh, energy for your building and uh, the and your transportation. So how can we do that by uh, super insulation of the buildings during uh, using efficient equipment, uh, efficient lighting, natural lighting, and uh, best uh, energy equipment. The the world has, you know, the developed world. Uh, I would say the. The, the countries with high energy consumption, they underwent a lot of development in the past 30, 40 years. So they kept increasing their thermal insulation in buildings every five to 10 years and reducing the uh, energy use in the, uh, index. So I would say that uh, if you have an energy problem in your country, then you need to start uh, moving in that direction as well, because we are doing that uh, as well in, in most of our projects. So we're moving towards reducing the uh, thermal, uh, 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 let's say, uh, conductance between uh, outside and inside through using more thermal insulation for the walls and roofs. And then <clears throat> you can develop your own rating systems. For example, this is in California, but uh, you can uh, check the consumption per uh, system and then determine the kilowatt hour per meter square. And these really are uh, nice systems that the engineers and the, and the uh, 
uh, students, uh, whether a master's level or PhD level or undergraduate level, they can do for different kind of facilities. And then it can be uh, national. So this is like uh, a reference in Germany where they go from the, the passive house design is maybe somebody of you have heard of this concept, but uh, you know the, the, the concept is to reduce the kilowatt hour per meter square per, per year. So this is a, a really the, 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 the trend or the, uh, the, the direction that most of the countries will move towards if they want to reduce their energy consumption. And the transportation, of course, we are to moving into electrical cars, buses. So this is one of the, let's say, cars, the electrical cars. Uh, uh, we have all also electrical, um, let's say, public transportation, uh, electrical buses, mainly in China, but now it is spreading all over the world, uh, electrical trains. Uh, this is, of course, it's a pilot, uh, and it's, it has a very nice story. So I, uh, I recommend that you read the, the, the story of how they developed this concept, uh, because the... Um, uh, Gerard, the, 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 the person with the idea uh, about this, uh, he wanted to develop a solar plane. So he went to the plane manufacturers and all of them, they rejected. Tell them, oh, you can't travel the world with the solar uh, plus uh, battery storage. Uh, but uh, he was sitting with his friends who are from the boat industry. I said, oh, oh we can do that for you. Let's do it. So they, the boat uh, uh designers actually uh, came up with the design for this uh, solar impulse plane that traveled the world uh, using only uh, uh, solar and batteries of course the uh, you'll see something like this uh, for the the, the boats as well but these are pilot what is more interesting is the giga factories and uh, I am sh confident, pretty confident that you will at one point in time during this, uh, between then during the next 10 years, you will see a giga factory in, in, uh, uh, in Africa. Right now, uh, the fourth giga factory is opening up in, um, uh, in Germany. The first one was in Nevada, the second one was in New York, the third one was in uh, Shanghai, and the fourth one is now uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Germany. So I'm definite uh, because the uh, Africa market is, is is really a booming market, you will see a, a, a gigafactory in Africa. So the, the water and access to water is very important and there's a lot of technologies that are uh, being developed. Uh, so we're using uh, solar hot water collectors with uh, solar PV, PV mod, uh, modules and producing uh, water from the air. So this is a technology that your uh, uh, graduates uh, and undergraduate students can develop uh, pilot projects and then opening up uh, uh, businesses uh, right now. Of course, desalination is very important in the future and it will be very, uh, let's say, accessible to a lot of people because of the low cost of kilowatt hour from uh, uh, from uh, from uh, PV modules. So uh, the, the uh, this is a, a renewable desalination plant uh, in Saudi Arabia, and I am sure that uh, we will see much many more uh, uh, plants like it in the future throughout the world. And uh, this is just an idea to cover. Uh, if you don't have space, you can also cover your uh, water channels with solar PV. So, uh, really, this, this is a pilot project in Jordan, but the idea is uh, from the North Europe. Uh, so we're taking desalinated, uh, the uh, uh, seawater and uh, we're doing desalination and then uh, treating the water and doing uh, irrigation and uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, producing a lot of food uh, and vegetation. So uh, this is a concept, and I'm sure that in the future we will see a lot of uh, a lot more. So climate change is happening all over the world, and these uh, this is in Petra. This is the second world uh, wonder in Jordan. There's a lot of uh, extreme weather events happening, like extreme water and. <laughs> 
the tunnels are being filled with water in, in a matter of uh, hours, you know, because of the extreme heavy rain. So basically, uh, NASA uh, is looking at the world and they have plenty of uh, uh, satellites, scientific satellites studying different uh, environmental climate change, uh, and they are really helping uh, everybody around the world. And I'm, I'm seriously, you know, uh, recommending that you keep tap of what's happening at NASA, so uh, you can understand closely what is happening around the world. Um, so there is a lot of uh, pollution, uh, a lot of uh, melting of the ice, uh, a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, and a lot of heat uh, is happening. So uh, <clears throat> these um, these polluted cities, in, in mainly in the big uh, uh, big cities, especially China. Uh, uh, the the thing is that they didn't care about uh, the the pollution in, in the past, uh, but right now they are moving towards. Uh, getting rid of these uh, fossil fuel uh, plants because uh, the pollution also assisted the, the pandemic. So there is a combined factors over here. So uh, maybe this is my last slide. So just uh, trying to show you that we're reaching to other uh, planets using also solar energy, renewable energy. So and this is facing the sun and uh, moving towards other energy. <coughs> the, um, uh, the health sector uh, is, is uh, uh, seeing a sharp increase in the energy demand. Uh, so we, we need to keep our social distancing. Uh, they are working 24 seven because the, uh, because the space, because of so many uh, restrictions and criteria. So there's a huge demand on personnel, disinfection material, and medical personnel. Uh, so the uh, the backbone to operate all of this is energy, and really energy engineers are needed at every step of the way. So I advise you to keep an eye on, uh, on, on these jobs. Uh, the education is changing as well. Uh, the schools and universities, uh, now we're doing it uh, online uh, and we're doing the exams online. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of opportunities to develop these uh, uh, curriculums and exams for the uh, energy engineers. And the upskilling is also very important and the sustainability is really the number one because without sustainability, we cannot proceed. And it has uh, to be economic economy is part of sustainability, but I mentioned economy again because uh, really uh, we are experiencing uh, uh, a big, big uh, uh, transition in the uh, in the job market, and uh, and that is affecting the economy. So uh, we have more freedom right now, and we have to take this opportunity. Uh, because of the increased internet com connections, the computers and online distancing. So really you can do whatever, basically whatever you want. So in conclusion, there's a lot of transition that it's happening and it is affordable and sustainable. And I, I, I recommend that you expand your skills. So you have to sharpen your skills and learn something new every day uh, and make change in your of influence. So uh, stay positive, uh, uh, stay happy, and uh, make sure that you, uh, because you are leaders in your community, because you are the ones every, that everybody is looking up to, make sure that you uh, uh, have a positive impact on your uh, uh, sphere of influence. Uh, electrification of things is, this is the future. Uh, please learn more about everything uh, I, you can about electrification of things. The reduction of pollution and climate change <clears throat> is something that is strongly uh, advocated by the policymakers, European uh, mainly, but this will spread, I'm sure, uh, once we have more uh, extreme weather events. Uh, electrification of transportation is happening because of, of the uh, manufacturers are moving towards electrification of their production lines and uh, renewable energy. 
hopefully it can be uh, grow at uh, uh, with your help with your knowledge it can grow in your community is to provide the demand and provide better opportunities the uh, stable return of an, an investment really you don't have to keep spending money on energy uh, because the renewable energy systems are are providing energy for 25 years or more and uh, i really recommend that you spend a lot of uh, time on capacity building uh, in, in all of these uh, energy sectors and it will create a lot of jobs uh, lastly i thank everybody the organizers caroline chris and wishing you all a unbelievable success uh, thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Samer. What, what a very detailed and powerful presentation. You know, they say numbers don't lie and energy numbers do not lie. We have seen numbers upon numbers. We have traveled the world to Italy, to Germany, to Nevada, to Saudi, to Jordan. We have traveled this morning to so many places and experienced energy statistics, energy facts, energy projects, and what's happening on the ground in a very special way. Thank you for taking us around the world and talking about what's happening on the globe and what we can do. Your 10 point action plan on the last slide is also very important. One thing about this conference is that we are moving from ideas to action. We have been accused as energy people, both tech and non-tech that we talk a lot and we don't act. And so from this conference, we will have great action plans and we are taking the 10 points that you have given us in the last slide and creating an action plan for that. So that this is about impact, it's about mobility, it's about moving, and it's about doing things, not just talking about things. I especially loved hearing about NASA and Mars. I felt like I was a little girl all over again and looking at things that are out there, but they're no longer out there. They're actually coming home and they're coming to pass and we are the ones to make that difference. I will take questions for you a little bit after this so that please stay on, don't move, don't leave. We want to take two more speakers and then have the questions at once. And so I'd love to introduce to you our next speaker from GIZ. Uh, Samer, you can stop sharing the screen so that we can then introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker for the day comes from GIZ. Her name is Lucy. I had to go online to look for the pronunciation of her name because you know, when we are working in the energy space, we need to be precise. One small mistake could cost you a life or lives or could cost you an entire nation. And so I went online to look at how to pronounce your name, Lucy. So Lucy Plushke. Lucy Plushke is the East Africa Hub Manager for Water, Energy and Food for GIZ. We talked about the importance of this nexus, water, energy and food. And GIZ is very passionate about it and passionate about changing and especially changing in, in Africa. And she's in charge of the East African region. So we welcome you, Lucy, to take us through your presentation, your keywords, and we shall then interact with you immediately after. Let's talk to Lucy. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So just give me one quick second. Um, here it is. And then we should be on track. All right, just a quick confirmation. Is it visible? It is. Okay, good. Then let me start. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this virtual conference on the World Energy Day in 2020. Um, I want to thank uh, innovators in Aria Finergy who have been pushing uh, this work and especially the work around at the World Energy Day. And um, we're very happy to, to partner up with you, to continue partnering up with you to uh, make Africa's energy sector more innovative, efficient and transformative. So I sort of picked up here on the theme of the conference already. Um, as, um, as Caroline said in the introduction, I manage the East Africa activities for an international initiative that's called Water and Energy for Food. Um, on behalf of the German Development Corporation, GIZ. Um, and there our goal is to scale up climate friendly and resource efficient innovations, particularly in the food and agriculture sector. Um, it seems like somewhat of a niche topic for the energy sector, but it is very cross sector in its nature. 
And um, what I want to touch on now in this presentation is exactly on this, how when we go across sectors, if we think from different angles, uh, new ideas come to light and particularly the innovation aspect um, is, is, is uh, new ideas come and it will become more innovative. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's also a very exciting day because uh, I think it started in 2012, this World Energy Day in, in Dubai. And ever since then, we've had activities like this one all around the world. Um, so it is a global event and it's, it's wonderful to see everyone come together. All right, so let us some start. Um, I was asked to speak at this conference and then I took a moment to think about the title, the future of energy. It's, it's, it's quite a big, uh, big thing um, that <laughs> to talk about. Um, and in particular, the innovation aspect, as I mentioned. Uh, I was asking myself, okay, what is innovative? What are the elements that I want to pick on? Um, and I was actually last week uh, in Masabit at the Tukana Wind Farm, so it was a little bit out of reach, <laughs> disconnected, um, but I was able to see some of the operation and it is impressive. Uh, in itself, the wind turbines aren't so innovative, we've had them for a while, but the scale and the location of the farm um, is incredible. It's innovative for Kenya, it's innovative for sort of grid-based systems. Um, and in general, it helped Kenya make great strides towards greening the energy mix, its energy mix, and improving access. Um, so that almost seems like it's become mainstream. Uh, uh, or oh, it is mainstream um, for when you look at the energy mix in Kenya. Um, so then what are the next challenges? What are the next frontiers where we can break through with innovation? What are the new markets and the new technologies? And so there, I just organized my, thought in, my thoughts into three. The first aspect is the great opportunities that are beyond your typical energy sectors. The previous speaker mentioned already transport, flying, um, car industry, um, boats, um, there's a lot of <laughs> diesel that is used and perhaps there are great opportunities, we'll see, um, if towards electrifying um, that sector. Agriculture is another one. Um, the second point is why not take the lead? Why not uh, for Kenya, Kenya or any other African country set the tone and uh, like build on these opportunities that lead to green jobs, to green recovery, especially sort of in the context of COVID and towards climate action. And the third aspect is that um, innovation or sort of the future for energy goes beyond technological solutions. It's about business models. It's about how we get finance to companies, uh, but also to users or customers. Um, and a lot can be done there. Um, that is that is that is new and innovative, and I'm just going to deep dive a little bit into uh, some of these aspects now. Um, the first thing I mentioned is the electrification of uh, different sectors that haven't been electrified or where it seemed to have been problematic before. Um, Africa's urban population is expected to add a half a billion by 2040. We are expecting greater energy demand from industrial production, agricultural production, processing, from mobility. Um, so we are expecting a greater demand in these sectors, um, which is another good reason to see, to invest a bit more into the electrification of those. Um, but not all of those things have to be on grid. And so now I'm just taking a look at the solar off-grid market. Um, <clears throat> Um, and solar off-grid, I mean, I'm speaking to an expert, I don't need to, to, to go too much into this, but essentially it is uh, a system that is not connected to the grid, usually has a battery, um, a battery system attached to it, and you can most importantly manage off-grid applications. And that's really useful, particularly in rural areas or in remote areas. Um, and agriculture then obviously comes to mind as a next, as a next frontier. Um, so when we talk about um, off-grid solutions, here you have a little bit of an overview. 
This comes from a Dahlberg analysis from 2018 that was quite extensive. And um, particularly in the agricultural area, we're looking at irrigation, we're looking at cooling, we're looking at drying and milling, but some of the other aspects too. Um, and there it gets interesting, particularly when you can combine uh, domestic users with industrial users or agri agricultural users. The multiple users is where we're really looking forward um, to working with at the moment. Um, um, and what kind of technologies in particular? So as we for food as my program, we're supporting in particular, as you can see here, water pumps, irrigation systems. You have various um, um, systems for cooling and drying and processing, like milling and husking and oil presses, etc. Um, and this is really kind of where, um yeah where we're looking into what is the market and how do we spread it and the idea is really um i mean there is some great companies that are african-based east african-based west african-based that's sort of where we are working but generally we're looking at the sub-saharan market um but it requires and that's mostly here in the first section the innovators those are the startups that are looking to scale those are the the smes that are that are that are taking um well that are that are growing and that are trying to reach new markets um there's also some multinationals that are that are um, pushing products into the into the market but uh one particular aspect here is that we also have to think of the financing that we have to think of the servicing and maintenance etc and that's where this ecosystem comes to life where a diverse range of of actors comes together on the market um at varying levels of maturity and 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 collaborates and that's really the space what is that is in my opinion, the most innovative and exciting, because here we are trying to um, not just become specialists in doing everything, but actually working in partnerships on uh, sort of the scaling of these new off-grid solutions. Um, and one particular point that is that is quite interesting as well is the role of mini-grid operators, um, just in, in the sense of, um, a lot of mini grid operators diversify their their sort of what they offer their products and services so it's not just energy a lot of times but they're actually offering um for example for e-mobility rental um but also sort of maintenance recharging stations for 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 various um, um technological applications etc and it's an interesting um it's interesting to see where this is going how these utility providers also play a role in service provision and um um yeah and 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 how that how that will um how yeah how that will come closer together and and hopefully um, um yeah help in scaling the innovation um, is there a market potential this is the next thing that i see and dalberg in this case looked into and um, here we can see that there is quite a significant um, market for solar off-grid. Um, it is the new frontier. It's not just about lighting. It's uh, in, in a sort of household level work, but it's really about reaping the benefits of sort of productive uses um, and, 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 and generating extra income with the energy produced. And this is really where it gets exciting because then it makes actual business sense to invest. This is when, um, this is when uh, there's real business models and business cases for off-grid solar applications. Um, from the research, you can see that uh, most companies are not yet at a scale that we would call mainstream. Uh, most companies sell less than 10,000 units a year of whatever product they offer, of if it be a solar pump or a cooling system, um, but it is growing and it's basically these companies that we're trying to help to reach the broader mainstream and go over 10,000 sales a year. Um, if you look at the markets, we see, of course, the big players, Kenya and Nigeria, um, as the top sales markets, um, but we also have Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Rwanda, and a bit of South Africa. So a lot of East Africa here um, for for sales markets. So 
and this is like really a, a survey based um, <clears throat> a survey based um, numbers from manufacturers, distributors, um, CEOs, and founders of com founders of companies of where they see the market going. Um, and if I look at this, I see a future. <laughs> I hope you do too. I hope these are inspiring numbers. Um, but we have to distinguish between addressable and serviceable markets. So the um, estimated productive use is the market for that is about 11.3 billion US dollars. So that's huge. If we look at the serviceable market, so at considering um, affordability, um, constraints and, 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 and distribution issues, then we're only looking well, only it's still a big market, but we're looking at about 734 million US dollars in the serviceable markets. Um, irrigation pumps seem to be the, the biggest player. Um, but um, in particular, as, as off-grid applications for processing develops, um, I, we, we can see, we can expect a, a bit of growth here as well um, in terms of the serviceable market. Um, there are barriers to this. We are aware of it. Um, of course, there's operational barriers as in people um, the, 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 the technologies offered or the solutions offered aren't as, 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 as productive as they, or as effective and efficient as they promise to be. But at the same time, a lot of this can be done, uh, can be outdone with training. So it can be uh, done, with, uh, can be addressed with, with awareness creation. Um, at the policy level, of course, sort of voluntary standards and 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 and, and um, yeah, compliance checks can be can be of course can can help. Um, but in general, uh, financial yeah. barriers are the. I uh, so, oh, sorry, this is really uh, one of the. Uh, yeah, as, sorry, I heard Julie in there. <laughs> um, uh, as some of the some of the issues that still need addressing. What I'm trying to say with this is, um, when we are now looking at off grid uh, off grid solar uh, technologies in this case, it's not just about the technologies. We're looking at it distributors. We're looking at that ecosystem that I that I proposed, and particularly the financing solutions and collaborations with financial institutions um, are crucial. And uh, that's really where, um, we, where, where this cross-sectoral nature comes in, because if you provide energy and you make money with it by using it um, in a productive manner, then you have a business case, which you might not have with Lightning. Um, that's not new, but it is exactly where the potential for, for, for new ideas, for, 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 for a greater uptake comes in. Um, the other example that I want to just look at is e-mobility. Um, there is great potential. I just uh, sort of divided and conquered into solar powered, which might be more focused on, well, uh, solar powered um, e-vehicles. Uh, often, particularly here in, in East Africa, we have two and three wheelers as the fastest growing transport mode. Um, if we look at numbers, this is um, from a World Bank report. Uh, we're looking at about 270 million motorcycles. This, these are worldwide numbers. Um, with expect uh, with an increase of about 50% use of motorcycles. Now, if we think of that as um, as shifting towards batteries that are electric powered, ideally solar power charged by 2030, then we have a massive reduction in CO2 emissions, as well as monetary savings um, for fuel, etc. Um, by 2050. So there's a real good argument as to particularly focusing on two and three wheelers, but um, generally sort of looking at the transport industry to, to go into, into e-mobility. Green hydrogen is another um, <laughs> hot topic at the moment, of course. Uh, costs are falling. 
this is the World Bank report, um, her costs are falling and particularly in Kenya, as we are in Kenya now, um, there's incredible uh, potential simply because there's such high daily radia irradiation, particularly in the north, um, that that is worth looking into in investing in. This is where the exciting things are happening and where definitely discussions are taking place um, to, to particularly look at heavier transport, so uh, heavier vehicles, trucks, buses, um, etc., uh, for the use of green hydrogen. So that's the potential. And then a skeptic could say, well, this is kind of European, they have the infrastructure, um, this might not really work yet in, in Africa. I want to back, ah, yeah, there we have it. So there is, there is already discussions with particularly around the bus rapid transport um, with the Kenyan government and the private actors as well. Um, yeah, basically, is it too early for e-mobility in Kenya? I'd say nah, things are happening. Um, at the moment, of course, we are still looking at um, smaller companies. There's just a few. Uh, it's absolutely not a comprehensive list of sort of these different actors in the in the space. But what's interesting is this is not just an urban phenomenon, it's also in rural areas that particularly e-cargo bikes, e-motorbikes are being used and that charging and rental services are um, being developed. We too is one of them. They are around Lake Victoria or on the shores of Lake Victoria. Um, a lot of it is still in the piloting stages, but um, we are looking at uh, looking at integrated uh, business models, for example. So if you have an electric um, motorbike and uh, you can combine that with cooling, solar cooling, solar powered cooling, um, is there op are there opportunities for, for example, the horticulture sector? to use these cooling and transport solutions to um, close gaps in the, particularly first mile gaps in the cold chain for agriculture. And does that help us to aggregate um, pro uh, produce and then sell, uh, sell at, a better, at, a better, at a better rate, for example. Um, we also looked at the fish industry. Uh, if you have a cold value chain and you can provide fresh fish to cities, in Western, it would be Kisumu, but as well as Nairobi or even Kampala. Um, in the north, when you look at Tokana, you have a lot of growing markets around um, the refugee camps. Lodwa is growing. Um, the cities are growing. They are, or the towns are growing in the north. Um, and particularly in the heat, those solutions combined transport and, and cooling could be, could be um, a game changer. Um, and again, it would mean that, well, we're looking into it if there is a prime, um, if, if there's a premium paid for these products that are using energy, in this case, for cooling. Um, uh, there's um, mostly assembling happening, but in the same spirit, it would be worth looking into, okay, what are the opportunities for manufacturing of e uh, e-transport solutions, what are the opportunities for, um, for, for, for jobs, for green jobs. And um, it is a dynamic market, things are happening. And uh, initially, now we have a new transport strategy also here for Kenya with greater ambitions to, to electrify um, um, the transport se uh, sector. And so that is yet another example of um, where we take um, collectively, <laughs> uh, next uh, greater strides into in in, um, in 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 greening, in innovating the energy sector in across yeah across uh, transport and agriculture and other topics. Um, <clears throat> the second point that I had was about um, why not take the lead in Africa? Why not uh, be visionary? Um, and that's basically building on this. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of opportunities for manufacturing as well. Why import, ex import um, 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 technologies when you can um, do it here? And with, with uh, new things, well, there, there's increasingly more 
um, also the smaller companies, the conversions, where there is skills, where there is the setup um, available to, to do that, to do the assembling, etc. here. The, the, the second point is um, um, the growing population, <laughs> the growing middle class um, means that there is increasingly more leisure time and um, there is, there is, I don't know, if we dream, if we innovate, if we think about, okay, what is possible? What, what are new ways of doing it? We can take the old, uh, I always think of the car wash with the Nyamachuma. Uh, people like it, why not also combine that and have a charging station there? So we're looking not just at um, um, sort of the hardware and the technologies, but we're looking at ways of how the distribution can be done, how charging can be done. Um, and and there's a lot of a lot of uh, entrepreneurship in, in 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 people's minds that to, to pick that up and and it's nice to see that um, I mentioned particularly the the lake region Victoria Lake region um, but other in other places we also have um, yeah it's 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 wonderful to travel the country and to see what is happening there. Um, so that's more on a side note. It's a strategic decision to to invest in, in, in new ideas of taking the rest, risk uh, as early adopters um, and, um, and working on getting the prices down because essentially that's what defines on whether an innovation is taken up. Um, and leading into this is uh, sort of the final point. It's also about business and finance, uh, financial models. Um, I let uh, Jenny Fletcher talk about um, what fin uh, area of energy is doing and uh, innovators are doing great things um, around energy efficiency but i do want to mention the the esco model that also innovators is um, pushing for um, which is the idea of an energy saving company and it's 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 what is innovative to us and what we're 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 really uh, as, as GIZ trying to support is, is, as I said, not the technology, but also these business models. And this is, of course, interesting because um, the ESCO company, the company is implementing and arranging for the financing of energy efficiency measures in facilities. And they're signing these energy saving performance contracts to essentially get a payment back from the savings that are um, achieved through through these energy efficiency measures. Um, the, the, the barrier, of course, is that companies don't often have the time, the expertise, the capital investment to implement such measures. And the value proposition is really, oh, we'll take care of that and we'll help you reduce costs, upgrade your infrastructure, reduce your carbon footprint, and uh, stabilize your energy supply, essentially. Um, it's an interesting, it's a great model. It's these kind of models that are coming out that are that are really um, um, that 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 are you know pushing the boundaries that are changing the sector in itself, how it's operating. Um, and 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 it's 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 I think there that we we have a lot we can learn a lot um, and 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 go forward. Uh, just to give you two more um, sort of. A business model ideas here. This is uh, Inspira Farms in Rwanda, but I've seen similar models with cold hubs in Nigeria, with um, Soko Fresh here in Kenya and others. Um, in this case, they're providing solar powered cold rooms uh, or pack houses. Um, and either they provide in house financing for clients to repay the costs for the installation of such, such systems, or they have sort of a pay as you chill system where they work with local entrepreneurs who are running the, the cooling system and um, it, are charging customers that are using the, co the cold storage uh, a certain fee um, according to what is stored um, to recover the costs. Um, Another very interesting example of how how you can bring these solutions uh, to people without uh, breaking bank. And the last example is Sun Culture. It's often <laughs> it often comes up. Sun Culture is uh, very active. Um, but what's interesting here is that they have um, 
started to a look at into sort of different uses for the solar energy that or the solar panels that are that are being installed and this at the moment it's light and for phone charging but also sort of the diversification of services um, they do soil testing and um, also crucially they're looking into in, uh, linking with internet with an internet of things with other data on climate on on, um, on, on, on rainfall, um, et cetera, so that um, farmers can be better informed about when to, when to apply water, how much, what are the crop water requirements about uh, fertilization, uh, fertilizer use, pesticide use, et cetera, um, basically through uh, additional advisory um, services and data of, of IoT platforms. And it's exactly this um, interoperability, that's the, the third point of the title really, um, where a lot of, um, where there's a lot of potential and um, yeah, where we're supporting as well. And that's sort of kind of coming to my conclusion. Um, I've mentioned water and energy for food in WE a lot. It's a multi-donor organized um, um, an initiative and we support such innovations as I've just mentioned. Um, mostly small and medium-sized enterprises in East and in West Africa, but we also have regional hubs in, in Asia, in, in, in the MENA region. Um, and uh, what we offer is financial assistance, assistance uh, investment advisory and business development support, um, as well as we can support R&D, partnerships, market studies, impact assessments, etc. And it's really through a similar setup that we got to know Aria Affinity. Um, and um, yeah, what I can say for now is that the innovation call is for the for the East Africa region and the West Africa region will be held in, in early 2021. And of course, we uh, encourage um, companies to apply and help us, well, take action, as Caroline said, <laughs> uh, to, to scale up these innovations and, and change the future of the energy sector in Africa. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Both speakers have talked about us taking the lead. Take action, take the lead. Samira talked about how we must just have a giga farm here. And Lucy is asking us, why can't we just take the lead? And we're responding to that positively and saying, we will indeed take the lead. We need to be early adopters, we need to take the lead. Lucy, your presentation has been very reflective. That's the word I am thinking of. When you look at the statistics that you have shared and where we are and where the countries in the West are, where Rwanda is, where Tanzania is, we need to have a congregation of energy professionals who come together to do things together. Earlier on, when we had the third round table, one of our <coughs> very um, passionate enthusiasts from South Africa, Jared Lake, was asking, where can we get together? We are doing so much in South Africa. The West Africans are doing so much. Where can we get together so that we can share these ideas and we are not doing disparate things in silos? And it is forums such as this that bring us together. East and West Africa, you have had the call early 2021, Water and Energy for Food is looking for projects. Let's start as conceptualizing them now come together and make things happen. Lucy, we will take your questions after this as well. We want to introduce a third speaker and then take the three questions together. Please put your questions on the chat. Our chat master will also look at that and moderate the questions as we bring in the other speakers. So our next speaker up is a lady as well. You will take note in this forum, we have been accused in the energy sector of not having enough ladies and that engineers are all men. Take a look at our lineup this morning. We have fantastic ladies in the house doing marvelous things, moving and shaking the energy space. We have McKenna Ireri coming up and immediately after McKenna, we have the acting director electricity and renewable energy from EPRA, Caroline Kimathi. So two ladies are coming up. So we have McKenna. McKenna is from CLASP and she's an energy research manager at CLASP. She's very passionate about research and research is what makes us do things from an informed perspective. She is working in the clean energy access space, access, access, because we can do all what we want to do, but if access is still a barrier, then we will not have made strides. She is passionate about social impact, social and environmental impact, and the benefits of access energy 
in Africa. And she's been doing projects in Asia and Africa. She will talk to us about charting the energy and interoperability transformation in this region. McKenna, we are ready to listen to you. Thank you so much, Caroline. And, and thank you so much, um, all the organizers for the opportunity to speak to this um, session. So um, shall I share my slides or are you sharing from your side? You may share your slides so that you can proceed okay. at your pace. Perfect. Yes. All right. Let's just put this in presentation mode. Just give me one minute. All right, um, is that visible to you all? Perfect. So our previous speakers have given us a really good context of the energy space globally and in the country. Um, and then, you know, also kind of given us an idea around innovations, innovations that are happening in the sector, um, you know, in a specific energy sector and also now moving towards this kind of off-grid space too. So what I want to talk about this morning is, is on the other, the, the third bit of that equation, which is interoperability um, and how that has the potential to kind of move us along that innovation chain and deliver um, services. So as you heard, my name is McKenna. I work for CLASP. CLASP is an international NGO. We've been around for 20 years and our focus really is um, energy efficiency uh, through the use of really high efficient appliances, high performing appliances of good quality. Um, we are also the co-secretariat for the Efficiency for Access Coalition, which um, is a body uh, um, we're trying to coordinate donors, um, investors, market players around the idea that um, increasing efficiency is really another tool that we can use for wider energy access across the sector. Uh, and, and as I talk about interoperability today, I want to give examples from the off-grid solar sector, which is what I'm most familiar with, and which is where we have some kind of concrete steps and road mapping um, towards kind of uh, wider interoperability. So, so maybe we start here with a little bit of a, of a kind of definition. What are we talking about when I talk about um, compatibility and interoperability and can we use this interchangeably? But really we're talking about the ability of, of systems to, to work together um, to function in the same kind of hardware and software environment um, without kind of affecting each other. And when we're talking about electrical devices, since we're talking about energy here, um, it's really when we connect these devices to a power source um, and we're connecting more than one device, how are they working without really having an, an adverse effect? And when we push the concept of interoperability further, um, we move from that idea of just like el that electrical compatibility to now um, communications and, and kind of um, being able to have devices communicate with each other, moving into the IoT sphere um, where protocols are shared between um, products. Um, and that kind of can allow, we can unlock so much with, with the ideas of, of interoperability. Um, and it, as we move towards a place where kind of devices are um, able to interoperate, we, we need to eventually be thinking about how we govern that, how we, what technical standards we form around that, um, and how we can make sure that we, we are kind of um, all moving in the same direction. We're standardizing and we're moving in the same direction. But that, this is just to kind of give that um, um, the context of what, we, what, I'm, what I'll be talking about. Um, but as we move towards interoperability, I think we have um, kind of, we have to weigh things. Um, the, it's not all um, kind of positive or depending on which side, which stakeholder, which side you are as a stakeholder, um, there are things to weigh up. So in terms, for example, for the consumer, an open system where let's say an appliance is completely interoperable with whatever energy system they're using, you know, whether it's kind of um, an off-grid system, which is DC based or an on-grid system, um, it can really open up um, the market for consumers, right? Um, it can lead to really great market growth um, because we are standardizing across and we don't have this kind of locking customers into one way of doing things, for example, with specialized connectors or things like that. Um, products, products and services and information can really come down in cost 
um, we can be able to kind of move into greater competitiveness and people really specializing in their business model rather than in the in the technology in the in the gadgets right but but really um, specializing in service delivery um, and that would give customers choice uh, would give us a better experience and and much better value for money but on the flip side the idea of having a really um, kind of bespoke uh, product um, where you know you are as a company, you have a very specialized way of kind of connecting your systems. It's very bespoke. It, it's it's all about like your service offering as a company is really attractive because it, it brings that uniqueness to your business. Um, it allows you to really vertically integrate from hardware to software to the finance um, financing that you're offering. Um, in, in a world of pay as you go, it also allows you to kind of you know, have this customer offer financing and be able to kind of uh, manage repayments because um, like the customers are sort of quote unquote locked in. Um, and that kind of um, more closed system can feel like it's presenting a lot of advantages. Uh, and, and it can feel sometimes that the open system could be quite risky in terms of um, your customers or um, being able to support them better uh, and being able to offer them quality given that you can't control kind of um, the products that they put together with your systems, for example, in an off-grid off space. So there's, there's this balance that companies um, and the sector will have to think about hard and, and kind of uh, pick and choose. Obviously, um, although I'm trying to be objective, I think an open system could offer a lot of opportunities um, where there's interoperability. And that's what I wanna talk about next is, you know, in a system where things are able to work together, communicate with each other, and when I say things, I mean product and the energy supply side, um, what would that do for, for consumers? What would that do for the sector? And where are the opportunities? Um, as I was saying before, it really offers um, a wide choice um, in the market, in the market of appliances, um, you know, as people are kind of moving from just accessing the electricity, you know, the electrons and moving towards wanting energy services, you know, that are provided by, for example, cooling provided by refrigerators or wanting to access TVs in off-grid spaces. Um, having that choice open to consumers is going to be um, kind of a game changer and interoperability would enable that. Um, it also would attract some of the big players that we really would like to see come into the sector. Um, in the off-grid market, we, we are kind of still, you know, very bespoke in terms of like the, the kind of products that are available for, for consumers. Uh, and we still haven't attracted the big players um, into the space. Uh, and I think part of that is, is because, you know, there's kind of this niche spaces where um, we don't have the big order quantities that, that are plants that the bigger plants manufacturers would be interested in. But if the systems are interoperable, then um, people could aggregate that demand for appliances, for example, um, and present that to kind of a big player. And that might be able to attract them into the space. For distributors, we're allowing them a much wider choice of what to couple with the energy systems. Um, right now, a distributor has to be quite, um, can be quite um, kind of restricted in, in what they can offer the consumer, because if they buy one type of solar home system, let's say, then they have to buy a complementary type of appliance because, you know, they, they kind of, they kind of only go together and there's no um, kind of open system where they're able to mix and match. So it could offer a lot of value for them um, and allow them to also switch easily between providers. That would also lower cost. Um, I mean, being a, a system where there's almost a monopoly uh, doesn't do great for, uh, for the market. So opening that up would just also bring down some of the cost. And then the environmental benefits are really huge. Um, right now, we're starting to see people um, sort of stacking their appliances. So um, because your appliance is tied to your energy system, if you want to buy a different appliance, you have to buy a whole system. You start, and what happens to the, the smaller, older system that you had? Um, that although solar e-waste is not the biggest proportion of e-waste in the region or even in the country, we're starting to see that this could be a problem. Um, and the contribution to e-waste from a lack of interoperability or, or inability for, to repair, all those kind of issues are, are will eventually um, kind of lead to a problem in, in the amount of solar e-waste that we're producing, for example. Um, and then obviously, we, it would be great to mitigate the risk of 
having kind of a non-harmonized system of, for example, plugs. I think we've seen this already in the conventional market where I, I wonder how many people have had this experience where you buy a new phone and it's all of a sudden comes with a different way to connect your ear, uh, your um, headphones or a different way to charge it. And now you have to buy a whole other system to support that specific device. So this kind of non-harmonization that's already happening in kind of in the wider space we can de-risk that early on and make sure that we are, we're building a system that is kind of um, future-proof. Um, but we also obviously don't wanna just talk about opportunities without paying attention to some of the inherent risks. I mean, it, it's, it's, oh, it's completely possible that consumers might have a really hard time being able to match, um, for example, their appliances with their energy systems or um, not doing that in a way that enhances the service delivery. Um, and that could lead to kind of some dissatisfaction in, in consumer circles. Also, you know, if we if we go to the peer you go companies, these are the companies that are offering financing. You know, they are creating a brand around some of these um, appliances, and so there is that reputational risk if if a mismatch happens um, and consumers don't get the service that they're expecting. Um, obviously, warranties and after sales um, of of, uh, of items that are not on brand that people are choosing kind of to buy and mix and match will also be dif very difficult. We already know in our sector, in our region, you know, warranty and after sales services have massive problem. Um, you know, we are not able to kind of, um, people are not able to access the warranties anyway, even when things are kind of streamlined. So in an interoperable system, in a, in a place where we're being interoperable, that could be a little bit more difficult. Um, the complexity in marketing and, and sales when um, this kind of, so much on offer could also come in. And especially when we're targeting um, rural customers, customers that are off the grid and remote, um, that messaging could be complicated to deliver. Um, and we would need uh, some sort of certification framework. Now building certification frameworks or standards, testing, um, consumer labels, all that system, that infrastructure is a big kind of um, task. That would be a big task for the sector um, to kind of build this whole framework. Um, and, and obviously, if we transition, for example, to new connectors, there could be some operational challenges. So not, we're not saying that there are no risks associated with the idea of, of having um, a system that is more interoperable, but I think some of these risks, there are ways to mitigate them. Uh, and none of them, I feel, are insurmountable. Um, so I just want to now give you a quick idea of, you know, as we, as we talk about what is the roadmap, what does it look like to move towards more standardization, more, interoperab more interoperability, where are kind of our roles, where, where can we play a role towards a system that, that's like that. Um, this, we built this when we were thinking about interoperability at the Efficiency for Access Coalition, we built a, a, a sort of roadmap because we were starting to see the challenges that would um, or car if we moved in a way that we, we that the sector just moves without kind of putting this at the forefront, putting interoperability at the forefront. So uh, we charted this path that moves from, you know, a very kind of hardware type of um, compatibility, you know, with the connectors, with the electrical interfaces. These, this kind of standardization in this area at the bottom of the screen there would have the biggest benefits for manufacturers and suppliers. And you can move all the way up towards kind of standardizing things like diagnostic, um, how you control load, standardizing all the way even up to the payments platforms and, and kind of the, the mechanisms we use around um, uh, payments and, and financing those payments. And those would really unlock that, would be the parts where we're starting to unlock the benefits for the consumers and distributors. So, so this is a kind of path we envisage from kind of standardizing, um, moving from the bottom up, from the more physical hardware side to the software side. Uh, and standardization is really going to be that building block um, to allow interoperability. Um, we feel, uh, you know, that there is going to need to be some major investment. Um, obviously, the more heavyweight players, players who are very active in the space, would need to come in. We need to kind of buy into the idea because um, if we, if we can change the sector, starting from let's say companies that that have a massive share of of the market, then that becomes an easier. Um, transition. Uh, and, and obviously we have to have a very compelling reason as to why we should kind of change the system and move towards something that's more interoperable. Um, so what we've started to do here, here's an example of what we've already started to do in the off-grid solar sector. 
So together with the GOGLA, um, the Global um, Off-Grid Lighting Association that represents solar home systems manufacturers, distributors, um, we have um, we have a working group, an interoperability working group, where we're working through what would it take to achieve interoperability um, at the solar home system space. So starting there, uh, starting kind of with the low hanging fruit and working our way to, to bigger systems. Um, uh, and how we've decided to arrange this is we're first going to start with, with, with the low hanging fruit of the connectors. Already it's an issue that, you know, every company has its own type of connector and that can cause kind of a lot of um, challenges in, in trying to, to make systems more interoperable. So that's where we're starting um, with a connector standard that is being discussed in this working group. Um, and then we're going to proceed to talk about now the communication protocols, uh, electrical interfacing, um, and then kind of branch out because we also realize that there's, you know, not all companies are going to want to do the same exact thing. Some want a very kind of um, bespoke, secured way, for example, of managing payments, and that's not somewhere they're willing to compromise to go interoperable. Whereas others are willing to kind of have a more standardized form of kind of um, this data exchange, uh, as far as even to the payment exchange, but with some digital security incorporated. So that's where you see section uh, number two and number three are kind of split out because we're kind of trying to explore these two different avenues and see which takes track. Because if we don't also bring the sector with us and do what serves the sector, then um, you know we just we can't just do it for ourselves. It has to also serve the needs of the sector. Um, and, and this is kind of to, to just put more color to that, um, a schematic of, of what we envisage that looking like. So the connector standard is really trying to address the appliance and their um, kind of connection to, to the control unit and standardizing that. And then the, the pay-as-you-go link or that communication protocol is trying to address the exchange of information. Um, but um, this kind of the nexus channel or the nexus channel core, depending on which way we go down, um, is going to address that next level of the controlling um, payments or locking and unlocking systems. Um, so just a schematic to make that a bit more uh, visual um, to interpret. Um, and, and really all these areas kind of start to complement each other to bring about full interoperability. If you go all the way to like, you know, this, this nexus core channel with the protocols around um, you know, payments, then we, we are achieving kind of full interoperability, but we can work independently on these different sectors with the, with the knowledge experts um, and make sure that we're trying to kind of um, join up. So what, what would it look like if we were to form a wider roadmap for interoperability in the sector? Um, I think if you if we work through this from the top down, what the market, the services that the market has right now are Kind of they are okay we are growing this the sector is growing the market is growing but i think there's so much we could get to so much better so we could work ourselves to to a place where we're delivering even better services more cheaper energy services that is and cheaper to the end consumer and that's going to need um you know different products and different services a movement for the current technology that exists right now to some technology, some which we're starting to get an idea of what that technology could look like, but even more technology in the distant future that we haven't yet kind of en envisaged, right, or worked on. Uh, and that means we have to build technological and um, we have to build this technology and we have to build the competencies around um, the use and application of this technology. So, so we need new technology, we need improved design, and that necessitates R&D. Um, you know, a lot of R&D has to go into improving what exists, but even into kind of formulating new ways um, of, you know, um, interoperability. So whether it's this communication protocols, the security um, kind of features that have to be integrated into these protocols, all these things are kind of things that are evolving and, and kind of need a lot of R&D. And the massive resource that should underpin that. So support, communication, and, and ideas exchange like we're doing in a conference like this, but also um, a lot of funding needs to come into the sector. We need incentives for companies to, to kind of move towards this area um, for other actors also to kind of buy into the ideas of interoperability and start to move um, the sector towards that. Uh, and we also have to underpin all this with quality assurance, making sure that um, whatever we're doing, we're, we are kind of maintaining that quality um, in the way that the energy is being supplied, but even in the, in the way that the appliances are being 
kind of develop uh, so that we have great greater energy services. And so for us in, in, in the off-grid um, sector in this working group, this is how we are seeing that happening. I think I've already kind of talked about um, the stack, which you know comes all the way from the connectors into this um, communication protocols. But associated with that technology part, we are also looking at the market and, and, and the development transition because we can't just work on the hardware. We also have to work on how we, inter how we get the market to move towards kind of this future that we want to see. So weighing up the risks and benefit for the sector and making those really available, thinking about what the testing and certification and all that is going to look like. Um, gathering market in intelligence as well to understand um, kind of what that future would look like, but also what, how that affects um, the market for different players. Um, and we're doing that through um, a lot of industry coordination. So there's, there's a steering group, there's this technological, the technology working group that I've talked about, and a lot of um, stakeholder engagement with partners, with the technical sector, um, with commercial players and financial um, institutions, all of who kind of play a big role into kind of enabling um, interoperability in, in the sector. So, I mean, that, 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 that's my last slide. Um, and just to say that, I, I guess the, the idea of interoperability can sometimes feel so techy, but I'm glad that I'm also talking to an audience that, that is, is, is quite technical and, and, and that's always um, exciting. Um, but the bigger picture is that if, if we move to a system where um, we're not, we are kind of moving towards um, interoperability, the benefits, there's so many benefits to it. Um, and not only just for the consumers, but even for us as a space, for actors, for you know, the energy engineers that were being spoken to this morning, there's just a lot of opportunity um, and the risks I think can be mitigated um, to get to that future. So um, thank you all so much. Um, my email is there, you can reach me for any questions. Um, and yeah, that, that's all right, it. indeed, very ex extremely exciting, Makena. You've said exciting, it is really, really exciting. At the beginning of the year when we were putting together the theme for this conference and we we're talking about innovation, efficiency and interoperability, we were asking why this last section, why interoperability, how does that come into the scheme of things, is it time, and the time is now, as you can see from McKenna's presentation really, we, we are working in parallel streams, people are, are innovating differently, those in the efficiency space are running with it, clean energy space running with it, gadgets and, and implements running with it, and we need to have synergy, we need to merge, we need to have interoperable systems running, and so therefore the roadmaps that you've shown us, Marken, are very interesting, we will share them with the team because those are a compass. We can look at those and work through and see what do we need to do? How do we make our systems more robust? How do we make them more to speak to each other loudly? And how do we have support? How do we have a user support, user experience um, framework that works to touch on every single point? So we are not funding this and then funding that, having this forum, that forum, the interoperability section of this is, is critical. And as we work through this conference, we will keep talking about that. Don't move from your from where you're sitting, Makena. We still want to ask you a few questions. And as we ask the other two, the other two speakers who've spoken about other things this morning, both Tamara and Lucy, we are moving into a discussion on policy, on regulation. We have the regulator with us. We have a, a representative from EPRA. And then we have two great panelists who are going to talk to us about policy, about partnerships, et cetera. But just before we do that, let's look at this very short video that um, we need to think about. Please take a look at it and give me your feedback immediately after. It's a two minute video. Please listen to it. Take a look at that. As energy people, it is not that we lack the content. It's how we say it. How do we want to say what we need to say? How do we talk about financing clean energy projects? How do we talk about interoperability? How do we talk about coming together as a continent to create energy change? How do we talk about moving and shaking things so that there's transformation in this world for every citizen of this planet with regards to energy 
projects, energy interventions, energy initiatives. So how are we saying what we are saying? And as we work through this three-day conference, we will be very careful to ask ourselves, is what we are saying landing? Is what we are saying making a difference? Is what we are saying going to create the transformation that we have set ourselves out to? We are here as the World Energy Day Secretariat Conference Fraternity and energy enthusiasts in this continent, let's be very de deliberate about how we say what we say. And that now shifts us to the next section of our conference. And we're talking about regulation policy. We are talking about nuts and bolts written, what's governable, what's not governable, what's enforceable, what's not enforceable. And we want to invite Caroline Kimathi. Caroline is, um, the Acting Director, Electricity and Renewable Energy, EPRA, Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority, would love to hear from you about policy and driving energy change and transformation in this continent with regards to policy. And immediately after Caroline, we shall have two great gentlemen, Mr. Makaka from KAM, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and we have engineer David Munene Mongi as well coming right up after we have listened to Caroline. So Caroline, please talk to us and then we shall have a panel of the two gentlemen and tie up the conversations. For the rest of us, please remember to put your questions on the chat and we shall attend to them. Welcome Caroline, Kimathi. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies from the Director General who was supposed to make this keynote address. He's not able to make it this morning. So allow me to go through the remarks that uh, he wanted to make during today's conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World uh, Energy Day celebration. And uh, to start off, let me start by quoting Ronald Reagan's nine most terrifying words in the English language. And I quote, I am from government and I am here to help. Uh, these ones were very sarcastic and were used to phrase, uh, they, they were used to illuminate the distrust citizens often have in the government policies, however useful they are for development. As we gather here today, ruminating over the role of policy in revolution of energy in Africa, I do hope that we will change the nine most terrifying words to become the nine most promising words in the English language. Uh, government policies, ladies and gentlemen, have continued to play an important role in energy market revolution in Africa. Uh, the demand and supply side of energy systems have always come from a Pareto optimality through the help of energy policies. Uh, the, the, sorry, energy markets fall under the category of imperfect markets in energy economics and establishment of policies is vital for quality, safety, and price competitiveness. For the energy market trinity to hold, policy must augment the demand and supply forces. Uh, policy instruments help to foster market failures. The trade of energy, uh, the trade of policy, energy supply, and energy demand are therefore important cogs around which the wheels of our economies rotate. Allow me to delve into the particularities of policy and energy revolution in Africa. One good analogy of discussing policy is through the lens of carrots, stick, and salmons. In Africa, an assortment of these three has been used to give the energy systems quantum leaps in terms of safety, affordability, quality, and sustainability. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, policy instruments have been used in Africa as a growing economy to improve sustainable energy. Creation of statutory bodies to speed up uptake of renewable energy has been one of the biggest policy achievements, especially in Kenya. Uh, the energy policy of 2004 and the Energy Act of 2006 led to creation of the Geothermal Development Company, as you know, GDC, as well as ERC, which is now EPRA, the organization that I represent, and Ketraco. Uh, this have led to the increase in the share of geothermal power in the installed capacity. Uh, in June 2004, we had uh, 214 megawatts of geothermal installed capacity out of, out of a total capacity of 1,229, accounting for 17.4%. With the policy intervention, which was cre uh, the creation of the GDC and Ketraco, this has uh, since increased to 678 megawatts out of the capacity of 2,970 uh, megawatts, accounting to, for 24.3%. As you can see from this example, Policy interventions have helped to improve the share of geothermal in our installed capacity. Furthermore, the system capacity has increased. So we may ask, how did the policy intervention assist? 
um, unbundling of the energy sector, improved efficiency, and has encouraged specialization. In addition, the statutory instruments that were developed as a result of the energy policy of 2004 and the Act of 2006 are uh, brought order to the sector, created incentivization schemes, improved quality through licensing of practitioners, created a conducive environment for foreign direct investments, and opened ways of stakeholder views to be incorporated into the running of the sector. Uh, as we may all know, the Energy Act of uh, 2006 has since been repealed, and we now have one of 2019. The reason I didn't mention it is that uh, as EPRA, we are now in the process of aligning our regulations to that act. So we are still operating on the old regulations, but uh, still uh, that is uh, work in progress. So as I conclude then, we may see that uh, policy instruments are essential for energy market prosperity. Energy stakeholders should embrace them as enablers. They should not think of them as adversarial parts of the market. Indeed, without the policy, the market would be in a disarray. And as the Igbo, like the Igbo community says, if you do not lick your lips, the hamatan will do it for you. Let us therefore own the process of developing and implementing policy instruments, for they are not a government property, but they, star, they are a star of the melting part of activities from the different energy stakeholders. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and let us be sustainable. Right. Great going, Carol. I think um, the last quote, the last Igbo quote about how the Hamatan will lick our lips for us if we don't do it has been the most exciting part of your presentation because we need to embrace um, the continent. We need to embrace the wise sayings that we have and we're able to align those to things that we need to put in place, even from a regulatory and policy perspective. You've told us to have a mindset shift and not think about policy as an instrument of government, but as an instrument of our own adoption for change. And so we are embracing that. I think we need to stop thinking about policy as the government with a big stick, you know, coming to beat us into shape, but as a tool, a tool for innovation, a tool for structure and order, and it is in structure and order that things happen. So thank you for sharing that. Please um, pass our regards as well to the Director General. We really appreciate these remarks and his participation through a very able representative. Actually, we have embraced you as you, and he will come at another time to give his own remarks. We have enjoyed your, 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 your presentation. Thank you for that. We have a few questions on the chat before we have our um, panel come up. And I think two or three of them are addressed to you, Mark Kenna you can tell us about your team's push for interoperability from an industry perspective, how, what collaborative efforts are you putting in place? And then Warren is asking about poor appliance quality. This is something we struggle with and we do not have um, a true north, a compass with which to measure and see are we being shortchanged or not. Makena, briefly. Sure. Yeah, I'll start with Martin um, about the response we've had from the in, from industry. As you can imagine, it's been quite mixed because of obviously the risks that are highlighted and, and, and also the fact that a lot of the off-grid solar companies are pay-as-you-go companies and so they inherently see more risks. But having said that, there are a couple of players who are really enthusiastic in, and are in actually very active in the working group and also in the steering committee for the work, working group because they see a kind of the need for interoperability and they see, they're starting to see the opportunities. So not just the risk, but also balancing out the opportunities. So I'd say it's been mixed, but we are encouraged by the participation in the working group. Um, and if you want to know more about the working group, please you know, send me an email and I can send you further details on that. Um, and then maybe about the, the poor appliance quality. I mean, what are we doing to ensure that that, that doesn't curtail our delivery? You, it, it is a big problem. Um, you know, inefficient, low quality appliances will mean that the service delivery that we're getting to end users is just not good enough. And so one of the things that we're doing is, um, I don't know if you've heard of Verasol. So Verasol is a quality assurance program that was traditionally, um, you know, Lighting Global Quality Assurance, um, which has been renamed, has been rebranded to now expand to include appliances, off-grid appliances specifically, um, both for home use and for productive use. So this is our one mechanism that we're using to kind of start to make, you know, test methods, um, start to think about quality assurance and, and the standards associated with that for off-grid appliances specifically. 
Um, I don't know if they'll right. right. There's a question also about um, aggregating different different uh, solutions for financing. Has that started working, or is it still in thought process? Yeah. So this one is harder. We're having a harder time with with uh, with financing, uh, just because um, it it's it's inherently really specific to the companies and the relationship they have with their investors or with their donors. And I'm assuming here we're talking about um, how to, to aggregate whatever the technological solutions um, for delivering financing. I'm assuming that's what Jenny means, but if not, Jenny, please correct me. But that's, that's much harder, much more difficult. There's some platforms like uh, Solaris have built a platform for that um, and it's starting to get traction. But the big players are still choosing to use their own bespoke systems for financing. Um, right. And so that will need a much bigger push. Right. I, I know we had said that we'd run seven energy professional roundtables in the run up to World Energy Day. But from what I'm getting from this forum is that we need a roundtable on interoperability on its own so that we can just uh, talk about it, pick it apart, put in our questions put in our thoughts and see how can we move this from just a, a conversation on a conference theme to a real actual action and see what's happening on the ground so that we don't have different players trying to do different things and we could all congregate and just be running in the same direction, running the same same marathon. So we will be inviting you, McKenna, you have um, planted the seed as you can see and we will want to water that seed, have it germinate and flourish. So thanks for answering those questions. There's a question for you, Caroline, but I ask that you hold a bit because some of the questions being asked to you are relevant to the two speakers coming up for the panel discussion. And so therefore, uh, please hold on, Caroline, don't go away. Right now, what we have for us is brought to you by Water and Energy for Foods, a project of GIZ, Enso Impact, Area of Energy and Innovators. These are the partners that are making this conference happen and hats off to them. So our next speaker up in panel format is Sylvester Makaka. Sylvester is a powerhouse. When you listen to him, you just want to sit at his feet and write notes. He is an executive officer, senior energy advisor at Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And you know what it means to be in the manufacturing sector and to have all these people under one roof and to push the energy agenda. And so Sylvester will be on a panel together with engineer David Monene. When we got engineer David Monene's CV, I thought, now how do we package this CV in one small brief introduction? It is impossible. He has over 42 years of experience in industry. As you see him there, he's what we call an elder, an elder in the energy space. And in Africa, when you're told you're an elder, it's a position of respect, it's a position of honor. And so engineer has um, a lot of experience all over Africa working on initiatives in the Nile, in Tanzania, in Zambia, across continents, cross continents, with policies, with parastatals, he sits on boards, he gives advisory for funding. And so we have a very rich panel coming up and I'd love to welcome both engineer David Monene and Sylvester Makaka to this conversation so that we can then talk a little bit about public private partnerships and the role of policy as well in driving the change that we want to see in this continent. So I'll start with you, Engineer Munene. Policy, does it really work? Is there hope? As Caroline spoke earlier, policy is something, and energy policy to be specific, is something that people take with a healthy dose of skepticism. Is policy important? Does it work? Are the, do the existing ones work or do we need to discard them and move on to new things? What is your take on the matter, Engineer Munene? Uh, thank you, Caroline. <clears throat> policy is, is very important when we talk about uh, public-private partnerships um, because um, policy is people who are coming to invest. When you are talking about the private sector, either you are going to be depending on, on, on citizens of that country or as normally happens in Africa, you are going to be depending on uh, people coming from outside, bringing in uh, foreign uh, investment. And what attracts them is the policy in that country. When they look at uh, country risks, for example, in the power sector where I, I mainly work, um, they are looking at what are the policies that the country has and, and um, do they augur well for, for private investment. And 
if there are certain policies that they will be looking for before they can decide that, yeah, this is a good country in which we want to, we should uh, invest. For example, if there are cost reflective tariffs, because if the tariffs are not reflective for in power, for, for example, then that makes them fear that uh, whatever they, when they sell power to the government utility, uh, the utility may not be able to have money to pay them back. And, and yet they are coming in to invest so that they can make a return on, on their investment. Uh, things like sell tax incentives, are they there? Um, and other, other important policies, like uh, if you have a feed-in tariff policy for renewable energy option, uh, for renewable energy development, or if, as is the case in Kenya, you are thinking of uh, going the way of South Africa and coming up with, uh, with renewable energy options. Um, there are some other policies that they may look at and, and see as a challenge. For example, the national uniform tariffs that we have in Kenya, which, which work well for people on the main grid or those who are on the public sector mini grids who are cross subsidized by the other customers who are on the main grid. But when you are looking at mini grids and you are thinking of getting the private sector to develop them, then an insistence on having the national uniform tariffs without any subsidies by government don't work don't work for such investors. So um, policies are very important. Um, a policy uh, in most countries, you have had the private sector investment uh, welcome in the generation and uh, some, to some extent distribution uh, sectors of the power supply chain. But so far, not much about uh, transmi in transmission. In Kenya, we, we are about, uh, Ketraco is about to, to commence some pilot program of public-private investment in transmission. So a policy like this, um, where the government has made it known uh, what it wants to do, is very good because it then sets a signal out there and, and people will see that uh, this may be a good market to, to, to come and invest in. However, depending on how policies are implemented, uh, they can be either deter investments or create the enabling environment that they were originally meant to do. For example, if you have, once the policy has been made public, it is in the public domain, it has been published, then what matters is the fidelity with which the government is going to implement that policy. If the government starts doing things that are contrary to the stated policy, then again, that government will be sending messages that uh, that that is a power market that you can't trust what the policy is saying, and that can have deleterious effect to what is intended uh, to in, in terms of attracting um, private sector investment in in, in energy. Uh, sometimes you may also find that uh, policies are important because they anchor or give birth to strategies. In Kenya, we just launched a few weeks ago the energy, the energy efficiency and conservation strategy. Before that last year, we had the um, agenda strategy. We had a government support measures policy um, th that the government has come up clearly saying what it can do to support private sector investment in infrastructure. Uh, and all these are very good uh, messages and, and, and form a good basis for those who are trying to make a decision whether Kenya is a good uh, destination for their investment or not um, to, to, to make that decision. Sometimes, of course, you may find that innovation or needs can drive policy. It's not always that you start with policy and then you get to the investment. Sometimes needs that are not, uh, are not provided for in the policy can create the need for policy to be, um, to, to be provided on, on those aspects. For example, in Kenya now, we have a situation where um, we, we have solar and wind that is working along with the 
with the other uh, sources of generation, hydros and geothermal. But the power purchase agreements do not provide for pricing of what is called ancillary services. And companies that are whose machines are providing that service, for example, hydros from Kenyan, feel that they are not being fully compensated. And that will ultimately drive towards having a policy on pricing of uh, pricing of uh, policy of pricing of ancillary services. So yes, policy is very, very important in shaping the way things go, but policy itself is also shaped by the way things are happening. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. I think what we are picking from you is that we need to be fluid. It's not always a one-way street. It's not always policy leading to actions and leading to attracting of investment and order. There's also needs-driven policy based on what is on the ground and what's emerging and the need to be very, very adaptive to change. We may have the actual needs driving the development of policy. Mr. Makaka, shall I, I ask you a question hey, about there's a bit of interruption from someone who needs to mute. I'm not sure who checked in. Please check. Please check if you're muted so that we can proceed with the discussion. Mr. Makaka, I wanted to ask about the manufacturing sector and just within the line of this policy discussion. Being at Kenya Association of Manufacturers and as well as uh, interlinkages with other manufacturing associations across Africa, it is said that the manufacturing sector are the, more, the ones that, um, what is the polite way to put it, break policy or do not implement policy as should be, especially in the energy space. What can be done to rein in manufacturers? What, what is your association doing in regards to that area to bring some compliance? Sylvester? Great question. A great question, and I want to start off by saying that uh, uh, policy in itself is a good thing, but having a stable policy regime goes a long way in supporting business decision-making process. And that said, uh, manufacturers, of course, follow uh, business-friendly policies that are in place. In Kenya, if I just want to make a reference to the, the energy management regulations as a policy, uh, it was embraced by manufacturers to the extent that uh, they were required to make deliberate energy audits across the manufacturing value chain and come up with a program to implement, which has had us lost. That one is because of uh, when policies are, uh, are formulated, one of the things we forget to look at is, or we, we miss out, is what would be the cost of implementing a policy across the board, whether and who will be financing. So in most cases you find when where policy has been formulated, enforcement may become a problem because the, who, the, the manufacturers view it as an expensive, to implement policy, or you have a lean technical expertise to support the implementation of that policy, and then you have a slow takeoff or a gradual uh, uptick. But I'm glad to say that uh, with time, when policies are accepted across the board and the costs associated to it are actually bearable, and the supporting system, the expertise, the technology, and everything that supports this policy as is, is in place, then you're likely to see a very quick uh, uptick. So the, the fear that, or the sentiments that manufacturers are slow into taking up or embracing new policy may not be quite accurate in the sense that I saw a presenter uh, showed us a graph of what is the growth path pathway like you may have a slow start and by the time now everything has been streamlined and everybody has or the, the, the whole system is streamlined then you get a peak like now we are experiencing a peak in uh, embracing renewable energy technologies into 
manufacturing. We are also experiencing a peak into energy management and audits across the manufacturing, but the start was for sure very slow. So it depends on three things. Are all the systems aligned to take that policy across? Thank you. Are all the systems aligned in order to take the policy from just policy in, into implementation and action? I'd like to ask Caroline, there was a question on the chat and it ties into what Sylvester is saying about the regulations. Caroline, there's a question about the new energy reg regulations. We've seen a call for stakeholder comments. We've seen a call for participation. When do you think this might come to pass? The energy fraternity is looking forward. There are areas that people feel could be a little different, but principally we are really looking forward. What are the next steps? Uh, thank you, Caroline, for that. Um, let me say that uh, when it comes to the regulations, uh, because it's not possible to do all the regulations envisaged in the acts together, we have uh, divided them in terms of you know what you're doing in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term. Short term being uh, basically the regulations that uh, we have been implementing, which you need to quickly convert to you know align to 2020. And uh, that is where like the solar regulations lie, the energy management, which are already out for stakeholder comments. Then we have uh, what you've classified as medium term. And this basically are the regulations that we had as drafts, but they could not uh, be published because there was no enabling law that time as, as in you're waiting for the Energy Act. And that could be, you know, something like the net metering regulations, uh, the, the um, mini grid re uh, regulations and so on. And then we have those ones that will take a bit of time. And these are the entirely new, the ones that are entirely new that, uh, you know, have not been there before. They're just proposals in this uh, new Energy Act of 2019. Having said mm. that, um, uh, we have already gazetted two regulations for comments, the solar and um, energy management. Uh, the one for, for solar already went past the period when you're supposed to receive comments, but that doesn't mean if you bring your comment right now, we are going to ignore it. Uh, what really slowed us down is, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic that you have been going through. And uh, of course, having to get some opinion from the AG's office, whether, you know, a purely online engagement would be considered stakeholder engagement enough. We have since gotten, uh, you know, advice from the AG and uh, we are running with the solar PV regulation. We are soon going to send out invitations to, you know, we will do a physical meeting while at the same time live streaming it for those who are not able to attend the physical meeting. Then after which then we forward them to the cabinet secretary for, you know, publishing. So we are moving quite fast of course with support from the task force that is implementing the energy act of 2019 uh, i may not give you a specific time when it will actually become law but uh, i know from uh, because you know uh, the publishing is outside our domain like i said just go to the cabinet secretary uh, but what i can say from our end uh, we have quite a number of regulations which we have uh, committed to at least have published by the end of the financial year which is uh, June 2020. And we've already started with the two that I've mentioned. Uh, we hope that, um, you know, uh, regulations such as the one starting on electricity supply, licensing of power undertakings will also have been published by the time the year comes to an end. So it is uh, quite an amount of work on our end, but uh, we have quite a young and committed team here that is doing their best to ensure that uh, we meet the targets that we have set for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers mm -hmm. that question. It absolutely answers the question and not only answers the question, it's very inspiring. It gives us hope. When you tell us that there's a young and committed team in place, it gives us the perspective that something is moving. And if we are having a hybrid, just like all the speakers have told us till, since morning, a hybrid of both physical and online meeting, we, we are adaptable to change and embracing tech and will not be stopped by barriers in our cause to change the, the energy space in this in this continent. Yeah, Engineer so Mwangi, I, based sorry. on... Uh, yeah, sorry, yes? So, sorry, sorry to cut you short. Maybe my challenge uh -huh. to the team that is attending this particular conference, uh, mm. just so that you don't feel left out, please look at the, the regulations that have been published. Uh, go through them. Let us have your comments. Uh, Sylvester here has been uh, very supportive of our activities. He's been, you know, working with us this journey. So I want to urge everybody, please take your time. 
give us comments to those regulations. At the end of the day, these regulations are supposed to enable the sector to move ahead. We are not here to curtail your business or anything like that. So please take your time, read the regulations, give us suggestions where we can improve so that then uh, whatever we come up with is something that you can now adopt uh, and uh, something that we also as a regulator are able to enforce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol, for that call to action. Just like we said from the beginning, we, this is an action-based conference. So all of us on this call, we are close to 100 people at some point, 190 something. The ball is in your court. Please take action. Please read. Please comment. Please send in your proposals, your suggestions, your ideas. And not only from the Kenyan space, because we have people from all over the continent, West Africa, South Africa, and even out of Africa on this call. If there's something that you feel that we could tweak as a country, we could tweak as a nation and make things better and benchmark against the ones that you already have that are working well, please provide your proposals. Engineer Mwangi, based on what Carol has said, you know, it's very easy to sit in the boardroom like this. You know, it's, people talk of boardroom policies. With your experience in the policy environment and around different projects in Africa, how do we ensure that there's policy at work? What examples of policy at work have you seen? Because uh, there's a Kenyan proverb that says, Kwa ground vitu ni, di ni different. And that means that on the ground, Things are different. Are things different on the ground, engineer? What's your experience? Okay. Um, one of the one of the policies that uh, I, I would say have been working though more slowly than one would have hoped is is uh, for example the feed-in tariff policy. Um, quite quite a lot of uh, renewable energy projects are at a development. Um, mainly because uh, there has been that policy from 2008 with revisions in 2010 and, and, and 2012. Um, and so, some projects should have, if it, uh, if it had not been for COVID that uh, has made the uh, KPOC request some of the projects to delay their commercial operation date, some would have come in uh, this calendar year to, to commercial operation. So I would say that uh, the feed-in tariff policy, though it has not had, it doesn't, it has had its own uh, challenges in the way it is implemented, uh, has has uh, been uh, has showed good results. And um, when the COVID measures are behind us and these projects uh, are allowed to, you know, to come into commercial operation, whether it's in December or June next year. Uh, then we shall see the, the results of that. Uh, what, what, of course, needs to be done now in Kenya specifically is then to see how to, to create the demand that uh, is going to be used, uh, that these projects are going to be supplying power to. Um, and policy, again, can, can influence how things go. I have in mind, for example, um, the, the government's um, tax incentives on, on the electric vehicles. And somebody was talking of uh, um, having electric uh, vehicle charging points where Nyamachoma, in Nyamachoma joins. And indeed, uh, that could be quite a good way of, of increasing electricity demand, even as we decarbonize our transport sector. And there may be other, other areas where things can be done to make sure that uh, we don't complain that the feeding tariff works so well and then now we have a surplus capacity that is costly and is, the cost is being reflected in customer bills. We, we are, as a country, we are not uh, powerless. We, we, we have things that we can do to make sure that we increase the demand, including, of course, as soon as possible, electrifying the SGR, which was supposed to come already electrified right from the beginning. Thank you. Right, right. Such exciting things you're talking about. We are taking note of each one of them. You know, sometimes it might seem so simple to map uh, a Nyamachoma joint to a charging port. And it, it sounds like something that, uh, that um, might not be a policy discussion. But it is indeed, because we've talked about interoperability this morning. This is how things come together, that you study the customer, you study the citizen, you study the populace, and bring convenience. 
So in the energy space, we need to really think about citizen convenience and how to pursue our agenda by having convenience at the fore. I want to ask uh, Mr. Makaka one last question, but before I do that, we are very interested in knowing what's happening around Africa. If you're not in the East African space or in the Kenyan space, please tell us on the chat, is policy working for you? What regulations are working? Is there something you think we can borrow? Is there something across this continent that we can put our heads together and create a change? So, Bwana uh, Makaka, tell us how we are going to create awareness around the manufacturing sector to be able to have implementation that is sustainable and works from an energy perspective. KM is accused sometimes, and let me just say it, that you, you focus on the big manufacturers. What happens to the little small cottage industries and the other manufacturers who have a big effect, even if they do not have a big voice? What, what do you have in terms of awareness creation? Great. I think, uh, let me start by saying that uh, KAM, as we know it, is a hub of very many activities touching on very many spheres of the economy. And we say that uh, we want to grow this economy as a manufacturing economy uh, and bring the contribution of manufacturing to the GDP from the current 9% or so to 15% by 2022. That's too close a timeline. And, uh, and we are looking at who are the contributors or stakeholders and, and where we can touch to realize this big journey of delivering to the economy. We have embraced the SMEs, and by SMEs, we are saying that we really, as a, a, a BMO, focusing on value addition manufacturing in Kenya, we are focusing on SMEs that are doing value addition in Kenya, within Kenya, and promising them a bigger tomorrow a bigger horizon in terms of market access, in terms of technology transformation, in terms of support systems to grow. We are also talking to the financial market, the financiers, the banks, the DFIs, and all that can support manufacturing in Kenya to come on board. And by this, we are creating partnerships we are creating linkages and we are looking at how then to trigger uh, bankable projects across manufacturing. And having said that, I'm looking at uh, the project pipeline that we are creating right from the data we have and the vision we have for industry to see that uh, we can link up manufacturing to affordable uh, finance, 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 and and have them grow sustainably. So we cannot, for sure, say that KM is focusing on the big boys. Big boys must handhold the small boys, because at some point the big boys started off as small boys, and they have grown to be the big boys they are today. So. The fear that uh, KM is a, a big band or a big boys club is just a perspective. I would say it's a perspective because when you see the, the, the big boys who have grown with us, you just look at them some 10 years ago, what they were, and look at them some 20 years ago, what they were, and see the difference. And it's, that has not just come for free. They have been working with us, working with us, taking our advice and taking the lead. That's why they are there, where they are. We are also uh, in the business of training and we are training expertise. We are tapping into tomorrow's technology, tapping into uh, tomorrow's world. And I can say that uh, we have embraced the industry 4.0, some call it 4.0, as a concept which we want to drive across 
manufacturing, whether you are an SME, you are a big manufacturer, because that is tomorrow's world. And if we don't embrace it now and move with it, then we some will be left behind, but for sure there are those that will embrace and run with it. So we are creating what I would call an awareness on very many spheres. And uh, energy has been one of our big wins, very big wins in the sense that uh, we partnered with government and one of, in one of our, or the, one of the key deliverables from the, our MOU with the government and Ministry of Energy is to promote, promote the penetration of uh, awareness on renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency. Some of our programs that run through the year and they are actually flagship programs is the Energy Management Awards, which reaches out to manufacturing institutions, government institutions, hospitals, um, hotel sector and hospitality. Now we have even brought in the horticultural sector. We have brought in the renewable, the solar. We brought in the, the water. So we are touching almost everybody. Maybe if we haven't touched you at all, then you need to raise up your hand and we will come calling so that we can show you what we, we can do. So awareness, awareness, awareness. This energy space cannot grow organically, so to speak, without creating that needed awareness because everybody's contribution makes a difference. And so if you are saving, you are making a difference. And if you are wasting, you are making a difference. The only difference is that when you are wasting energy, the difference is negative. And when you are saving energy, the difference is much, much more positive. So we are looking at going very public and talking about what we do. And what we do is creating a difference in the manufacturing. And we have seen that uh, there's a lot of what I want to describe as legacy technologies, the comfort zone, because you have some money and you want to invest, you think expensive is too exp expensive, technology is too expensive, or modern technology is too expensive. So you go for what I want to describe as legacy technologies, where you just want to produce, you are not bothered or not really keen on the cost of production. So when, when, when we reach you, we transform your thinking and create a, a paradigm shift and take you now to a, a pathway to success and a pathway to efficiency. That's what we do. And we think that uh, we are equal to the task. If you read the in National Energy Efficiency and Conservation Strategy document, we just launched it this month. It was virtual, so I know most people may not have in a position to attend. There's a very big uh, vision on where we want to take the energy efficiency in uh, space in Kenya. And the campaign is big, it's touching on uh, household, it's touching on manufacturing, it's touching on uh, e-mobility, it's touching on uh, renewable space, and we have clear targets on what we need to get and what we need to achieve. So that means that uh, you cannot talk about energy and leave uh, uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers out of the discussion. So right. we are here to, to serve industry and touch everybody's life. Thank you. All right, I, I hear your loud call about inclusion and how each and every person, you have heard it, dear ones, on this call. The, the hand is being out, handshake. The handshake is being outstretched. Please grab a hold of KAM's hand. No matter what level you are in industry, they're here to work together with you and have this energy agenda be all inclusive so that we are all succeeding. Because when we succeed as a continent, we all succeed. If part of this continent is not succeeding, if say West Africa is doing a great job and East Africa is not succeeding, we have not succeeded. So KAM are the, taking the lead in this area. Please, I'll stretch your hands and let's have cross-continent discussions on how we can have awareness going. It is with awareness that thing everything starts. 
I also take note that KM, you are having the Emma Awards on, at the end of this month. We always look forward to that as you celebrate organizations across the board who are doing great things and making great impact with regards to energy management. So everyone on this call, book your diaries for 30th of October, Sylvester and team will be having energy management awards for this season. This is in complement with the ones we will be having on Friday, which touch on people, not necessarily corporates, but it is people within those corporates who are moving and shaking things. To us are the energy professional awards, and theirs are the Energy Management Awards. So 30th of October, please book your diaries for that. I'd like us to swing into the breakouts. We have talked a lot. It is your time to talk. We have spoken and spoken. It is now time for all of you to speak. We have two tracks and you will be assigned to the tracks. One track is on financing and reporting and the other track is on technology, innovation and interoperability. And both David, uh, Caroline and Sylvester will be available in these tracks. We've not let go of them with their rich, rich hub of information. So in one track, we will have Jenny, who is the co-founder and CEO of ARIA. And we'll also have Mr. Amai Inamda, who is the managing director of Kawisafi Ventures talking about financing and reporting, a critical conversation. On this other end, we will have Troy, who is the Chief Technical Officer at Aria Finergy, as well as Jesse Forrester, CEO of Mazi Mobility, talking about innovation, technology, and how do we move forward from here. So you will see a notification for breakouts on your screens. Please join the breakout rooms. Please do not worry about missing out. Once we are done with the breakouts, we will congregate once again and share the findings from each breakout. So you'll get a distilled version. So if you're in financing, you'll get a distilled version of tech. If you're in the tech room, you'll get a distilled version of financing. So we'll come back and have actions. Remember, this is an action-packed, action-oriented conference. We will have actions, practical things that we can go and do. So welcome back. We were talking about financing and reporting, and we're also talking about tech conversations, data, mobility, innovation, interoperability, and would love to hear what you are all discussing so that we don't feel a formal fear of missing out and feel left out of what was said in the other room. So I'll ask the moderator for the finance and reporting room to please give us a very brief snapshot, about five minutes or so. What did you discuss? What can we take home? What action? We are living here different. What actions can we put in place going forwards? Over to you, Warren. All right, thanks, Cairo. Um, the session was quite exciting. Um, we managed our time well, so I think we went through a lot of the points. Uh, we were talking about uh, generally around the investment landscape um, across Africa, as far as clean energy and um, energy efficiency projects are involved. And we had uh, Amar and uh, Jenny who painted the, a really interesting picture of what the landscape is like, what the where the successes have been, and uh, even where the challenges and what energy professionals can, can sort of uh, watch out for um, in bringing their investments uh, into the African uh, economies. And so uh, from um, Jenny, uh, we sort of went through the process of choosing which, sort, which investment uh, would make sense and how to align your investments to the correct investor. Um, and one of the things that stood out was that um, you need to have a, a very well accounted for organization, i.e. if you're at least three years into the business and have um, at least three years of audited financial accounts and can show your track record as you, you've been growing, that is a, a fast good step for investors to look into and see credibility in your project. Uh, the other thing is um, choosing the right partner because um, when you're looking for an invest, investor, you need to understand how the investors look at projects, what projects do they invest in, um, what are their main interest points in terms of the impact of these projects. Uh, so you need to find whether you are strategically aligned to the objectives of your investors. And the other thing um, is about project scale. So for, for again, demonstrating the growth of your company, you need to show um, the scale at which your project is going to impact, as well as how your organization will grow, uh, because there, there is an, a capital stack, as was highlighted by uh, Omar, i.e. projects of a smaller scale will tend to attract 
uh, grants and even a smaller, uh, well, smaller ticket funding. Uh, and those of the higher end probably venture funds will attract uh, or will want you to present bigger projects or projects of a, a you know, bigger ticket size. And so you also need to understand what are your, where is your project falling in that investor stack or in that band? Are you um, a relatively small uh, uh, invest? Uh, are you looking for a small investment? I.e., uh, for the case of solar, we're estimating it at about one megawatt. Uh, anywhere less than that is qualifies as a, as a small project, which would probably be taken up by either a really small fund or uh, a grant for you as, as you're building up your capacity. And then after that, we looked at uh, from an investor side how what are investors looking for in going into business with um, these energy efficiency and clean energy implementers. And number one, that what stood out is that the business model has to be right. We have to understand what is the core core product, core value, core vision that your your organization is holding. Uh, and and then it's it's a two way relationship. The, the same way you as a as an organization are looking for an investor and looking at their strategic objectives, investors will also look back and see are you also fit or aligning to some of their objectives. Unit economics is an important point of proof uh, about how the performance of um, your project is going to be to, to be in the long run. Um, your potential to scale, because uh, at the end of the day, um, this is money that's being entrusted to you that it, it grows and it makes an impact and also, you know, brings profit that can support other businesses. So there has to be a demonstrable uh, way of project scale um, in, in these organizations and what uh, investments we are proposing as, as, as implementers of energy efficiency projects. Some of the challenges that came out of uh, aligning or making a better investment um, environment was um, proving or really surviving the first four years of a business. That is, we can even call it the entrepreneurial time where you're taking a lot of risks, you're, you're testing different models, you're, you're bringing on a team, you're learning, you're teaching, you're maybe one or two departments in one person. So this is the time where even for investors, it's, it might not be as attractive because you're still quite high risk. Um, and that is almost an inevitable challenge because everyone has to go through that period, especially here in Africa, where um, you it's very meritocratic, where you have to fast prove your performance and prove your growth before you are giving any, or you can access any further funds. That becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, but then the, um, the, the other thing, is to prove your business case. As you're growing, it's important for you to account and, and keep track of um, how exactly your business is growing because this becomes important when talking to your potential investors. Um, finally, uh, as we've identified some of the challenges, um, transparency well, and, uh, and market depth are a, a, a little bit of an, an investor's challenge because uh, the, the market is not having um, enough capital in circulation, as Omar had, had also mentioned, that we're not seeing um, as huge of money being recycled in economies as maybe in, in European or, or American markets. Uh, but this is something that is bound to grow as more investments are coming in, as more organizations are finding better innovative solutions. Um, this is something that will take time. And so for, for even uh, investors, it's a, it's a game of almost uh, bordering patience. Um, and the same applies for uh, organizations looking for um, these investments. Uh, so a bit of patience. Um, um, looking at the solutions, as I wrap up, regulations is one of the pivotal points in setting pace for growth in the market. Um, when investors are looking to invest in your project in a particular country, uh, they'll tend to see what kind of a regulatory landscape is around you know, where you want to have your projects. Are there supporting measures? Um, are there enough structures to support if anything um, is to happen, whether positively or negatively to, to your project or to their investments? So uh, regulations is an important factor to, to capture as uh, 
from a, a, a government point and it would be good for us as professionals to take away that we also need to continue engaging with government especially in um, putting in place progressive um, policy frameworks um, and then finally um, on the spirit of entrepreneurial entrepreneurship um, that is another secret weapon to all of us operating uh, and meeting here today. Um, it shows that we are willing to uh, learn something new, to, to go the extra mile, to connect and find projects and areas of collaboration. So that is a, a solution that will always stick with us as players in Africa. Um, so this is just another um, encouragement that came out from the group that uh, we need to continue even um, as the regulations catch up, as uh, policies being proposed, we have to continue as innovators in the space. Thanks, and back to you, Carol. Okay. Uh, hi, all. Uh, if Warren, you have, it seems uh, Carol has dropped off a bit. So maybe I can quickly just jump in and speak about the findings that we had from the second breakout room which was focused on technology, innovation, and interoperability. And we had two speakers, Jesse Forrester and uh, Troy Barry. And okay. hopefully I'm, I'm audible. Okay, great. And so on the first item of discussion was on having a clean mobility transition in Africa and what ingredients we need to explore to make this happen. Uh, we were lucky to have the CEO of Mazi Mobility, Jesse Forrester, who is already in the field, and he gave us such strong insights um, on the same topic. And his main focus was on mass mobility. Um, he says he got a lot of uh, questions asking him on whether he is the new tester in the East Africa, and somehow EVs have been attached to the foreign um, perception of what immobility should be. And we should acknowledge that the, we have different needs, we have different uh, geographical um, landscape as well. We have the two-wheeler, the three-wheeler, we have the buses, the matatus. And so his best approach was on the mass mobility where it's just focusing on Nairobi alone up to 60% of the residents um, commute using the public transport. We have the 14-seater to the 60-seater. And the best way to provide this access to uh, to all the residents, uh, to most of the residents, and cut down on the CO2, uh, and cut down on the CO2 emissions would be battery swap. Uh, his company is a battery service uh, company, where instead of having to wait for a whole new uh, electric uh, electric vehicle uh, imported, manufactured, and assembled, what they offer is they convert the already existing. Um, engine, the internal combustion engine, and swap it to the battery. And with that, we have easier, it's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's uh, more efficient to accelerate the transition into electric mobility. Um, another section would be on having an ecosystem approach to the whole transition, that it is not just the switch from ICE to EV. It is more on um, how quick and how well can we efficiently adopt this new technology in in Africa. We even have the, the, the opportunity to bring on technology. He had a statement on data, things, and people, where you can easily use IoT and technology to track the vehicles. And this coincided so well with uh, our second topic, which is on data, and how we can use this data to come up with a virtual grid. We can use it to track drivers and even create incentives for those drivers who are performing quite well. So uh, he gave us such a nice picture on how we can have immobility customized to our local uh, needs. Uh, another thing is uh, we moved on to the topic of uh, technologies in the electrical utility sector. And what stood out, this was covered by Troy Barry from Aria. Uh, what stood out was that energy storage is the game changer. This is the real game changer in this sector. We have all experienced some form of power outage. We have all experienced some form of blackout. And as much as the country, especially Kenya, has really adopted the renewable um, 
uh, renewable uh, renewable technologies as its uh, as its main generation, there is still a huge mismatch between production and demand. We seemed to have um, overprojected on our being ambitious on our capacity, yet we did not have a clear route on how this demand is going to be socked up. So we still have high tariffs. Uh, we still have our main distributor in Kenya currently um, facing losses despite being a monopoly. And uh, investment in energy storage and distributed generation offers the key and the game changer to change the whole uh, dynamic in electrical utility uh, in the continent and in Kenya especially. So with those uh, brief remarks, we also had an overlap between electrical mobility offering the ramping up to the demand to be able to soak up this generated uh, this uh, over this surplus of generation from uh, from our utilities, where electrical vehicles are considered to be sort of energy intensive, and since we have that, um, since we have uh, the generation already there, electrical vehicles offer to provide a platform where this demand can be ramped up and uh, match the generation. Uh, those are a few. Uh, remarks. It was such a nice session. We were the ones protesting. We needed about two, two hours to cover everything. I am. Uh, in fact, there was a question that even was pending uh, once the countdown was running. Uh, so back to you, uh, Caroline. All right. I can see we need lots of more webinars back by public demand. We may need one just for this for that group and to take that conversation forward. I think what's coming through right from the beginning from when Samir Zawaide was talking about storage and how if we can crack that as a continent, we, we will solve so many things that are pending and so many areas that we need to, to grab a hold of. The discussion so far are pointing towards us taking charge of energy change. The, the change starts with us and we need to take charge of it. And a forum such as this where we have all these ideas come together is just the beginning of that change. If we run through the great, great presentations we've had from Morning So Rich, right from the AE president coming down to Lucy from GIZ, coming down to McKenna Irreri and the interoperability conversation happening there, from Caroline from EPRA talking to us from the government's voice, right down to our two panelists whom I felt we didn't even exhaust their, their, their thoughts and we need to have them come back, Engineer, Engineer David and uh, Mr. Makaka Sylvester from KM. We need to continue these conversations. It's just that time, time is, is, is a limiting factor. We need to create more time. The breakout groups with both uh, Mr. Inamdar and Jenny and as well as Mr. Forrester and Troy, we, we need to just um, take action, take action. So we shall put together an action plan from all the discussions because all the presentations we have received, all the discussions we have had, there are actions coming in from there. So let us take action from that and then talk about what the next steps are. So uh, the next steps from this con conference day one is that we shall put together the actions and send them out to you so that work starts immediately. The work has only just begun. It is not good for us to just sit here and yap, 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 and talk, 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 and have people just continuously say how people purporting to create energy change just talk a lot and have no action. The action starts with us. Each and every one of us needs to make a difference. And in the words of Mahatma Gandhi, to be the change that we want to see in this world. Energy rules the world. Let us be that change. We shall send out the actions to each one of you. So mine is to thank everybody. I don't know where to start but to thank every single person who's shown up today. We've been consistently at around 90 participants on this call from when we started and we are still about 90. That just goes to show you how engaging these conversations have been. We have a power packed, pun intended, total pun intended, power packed, power packed day tomorrow. We are talking about sustainable development goals because the SDGs is what we must all align to. And SDG 17 is about implementation implementing. So we will be talking about sustainable development goals. We have uh, Mr. Logedi from the GENS project in uh, from the University of Brunel coming to talk to us about how we can make things happen from a research innovation perspective and financial inclusion models. We have great speakers. We have Stephen Fox 
whom we call the father of financial uh, ESCO. We talked about ESCO. I think Lucy talked a lot about ESCO. Stephen Fox will be here to talk to us about green bonds and the ESCO model and what we can do. We have Mark Ben from GIZ as well, practical steps from the ground. We have the CEO of Absolicon, Joachim Bystron, who has graced one of our webinars before and has come back by popular demand to come and talk to us about renewables. The AE president was very passionate about renewables. Let's, let's plug into that conversation. And then we will have a demo, a practical demo on our financial engine that um, calculates and is able to do um, monitoring evaluation of exactly what spend is, is, comes through from our energy project. So you can see, you don't want to move from here. Tomorrow we need to meet at nine o'clock in the morning and spend our morning the same way we have today with such value adding inputs, because when you input value, you can only output value. So the value we've input today will result in valuable outputs. So we thank you very much. We are very happy to have had this day one of the conference extremely successful. Our thanks goes out to all our sponsors and partners. We have GIZ on the Water and Energy for Food project. We have Enzo Impact and the convening partners, Aria of Energy and Innovators. You have done an amazing job. Let's keep going. Thank you very much, everybody. We are free to exit the meeting. And we meet tomorrow at 9 o'clock on the same link. So once you have the link, you can just log on. Invite everybody to come along. You cannot be just enjoying this value and inputting value for your, yourself. The society revolves around people who are like-minded. So call everybody to come, come along. So thank you everyone, goodbye, and God bless you all, and let's see each other tomorrow.